Good morning. Welcome to the 20th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we start, can I advise members there's to be a minute's silence at 12pm to commemorate the victims of the Finsbury Park bombing a year ago, which we will be observing. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I have apologies from Donald Cameron and Alex Neal. I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item six in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The second item of business today is to hear evidence from the Scottish Government officials on stage one of the Climate Change Bill. Can I welcome Mark Eglingen, Sarah Granger, Dr Tom Russin, and Callum Webster. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'll move straight to questions. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, basically, the, the, the first question I'd like to ask is just in addition to the climate ch UK Climate Change Committee, that's the primary source of scientific advice uh, for government, were there other sources of scientific advice that uh, were considered in uh, deriving the contents of the bill? Um, the answer is both yes and no, um, which I will explain. Um, so the advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change has a, a, a certain level of primacy in what we consi consider, and um, that's for two reasons. The first reason is that in the 2009 Act of this Parliament, um, that, that Act requires that Scottish ministers both seek and consider the advice from the relevant body, and it designates the UK Committee on Climate Change as that relevant body. So ministers have to um, consider, seek and consider their advice. Um, the second reason we, we take their advice particularly seriously is because um, it's because it's hard to think of another body that has that same level of expertise um, contained within it. The, um, the UK Triple C is quite remarkable in terms of the, the breadth and depth of expertise of the people within it, both at the Secretariat and at the actual committee level. They cover um, various different climate science um, specialisms, behavioural science economics, cognitive science, technology, I'm certainly missing some, but I think you get my point. Um, so they, they really are the sort of ideal set of people um, to provide advice. However, um, there is nothing in the Act that means that we can't look more widely, and we certainly do consider um, information um, and analysis and opinions from a much broader range of people the CCC themselves, in, um, in coming to their advice, one of the first things that they do is issue a call for evidence. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, that's entirely open. Um, and any body um, within the UK, and probably internationally, I, I guess, um, can contribute to that. So that forms, um, so that contributes to the advice that they give. When we get the advice, and when we got the advice on this occasion, um, we uh, test it out with a few people. We do some internal analysis and some internal thinking, um, and we then um, consult on the, on the basis of that advice. Ministers were of the view that they did want to take one of the CCC's options, so we consulted on that, which of course provides an opportunity for a much broader range of people to put forward their views. Um, we conducted some analysis ourselves, I mentioned, um, both using times and looking internationally at uh, various examples of good practice and interesting practice. Um, so I think if I'm answering your question, um, then yes, in conclusion, we do prim primarily rely on the advice from the CCC because we are required to under the legislation and because they are excellent, but we are not uh, closed to other sources of information. Um, as we're trying to do an awful lot in the time we've got, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but I suspect it'd be quite useful if you could give us a note of all the sources of scientific advice. Is it scientific advice? 
in, in particular that you've taken into account. OK, yeah, we'll do that. Right, now, just uh, I've got one other uh, relatively small point in relation to the UK Climate Change Committee's advice. Um, the 90% the figure that they uh, say is at the outer edge of achievability, uh, I understand includes a uh, 100% reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. And I'd just like to get on the record that that is the case. Much the case, yes. Right, well, and and maybe just to take the opportunity in the light of that, um, I have already drafted an amendment to the bill, which would put right at the front um, that the Scottish ministers must ensure that the net Scottish emissions of carbon dioxide for the year 2050 is at least 100% lower than the baseline. Uh, the phrase at least 100% is, of course, interesting because it could be more than 100%, um, and that option is left open. Convener. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks. Um, the international scientific consensus on climate change is very much driven by the IPCC, uh, and they're scheduled to bring out a fresh report on the climate science in October. Now, there are some uh, draft leaked copies of this report that are appearing on the internet. I don't know if you've seen them at all. But what it, what it does say uh, in these leaks is that uh, the world must move towards a net zero carbon target by 2050. So I'm wondering on, on the back of that, if that is the conclusion of the IPCC, what kind of scientific uh, advice and support will you be requesting from the UK Climate Change Committee about how to deliver that? OK, I am aware that the um, IPCC report has been leaked. I haven't studied it, um, and uh, we won't be looking at leaked um, copies in any depth. We'll wait until the final um, version is available, which I understand is going to be the 8th of October, but certainly early October, um, I think. So um, the Cabinet Secretary wrote to the relevant UK Minister, Claire Perry um, requesting um, that the advice that um, the UK government have indicated that they're going to be asking the CCC for on the back of the IPCC report um, is, is commissioned um, jointly from the Scottish government as well, because clearly um, we're going to need much the same information. Um, I understand that um, Claire Perry has responded to that letter, agreeing that the UK government and the Scottish government should work together on that. Um, but no further details available on that just at the moment. So I'm really not able to tell you anything about um, exactly what that request for um, request for advice will cover, and yeah. much less what the ad advice may be forthcoming from the Committee on Climate Change. There isn't really very far I can go in saying how that might play out. But timescale is obviously very important here uh -huh. in terms of this committee's consideration of the bill. So will that advice come back to this committee before consideration of stage two amendment? Because I'm not, um, I, I'm not able to say any, anything about the timescales for that advice. I don't know either when the request will well, issue. Do, do you think it should? Uh, I don't think that that's for me to say. I think that that's a matter both for ministers and the committee and the parliament. My understanding is that the um, decisions on the timescale for the stages of the bill, now it's in Parliament, is a matter for Parliament. Um, okay. So I'm not sure my opinion is of a great okay. deal of If I could just come back to the IPCC advice then. Uh, there does seem to be a little bit of confusion within the policy memorandum for this bill because the, the target we're aiming for in order to prevent, you know, catastrophic loss of wildlife, um, prevent environmental refugeeism, save the economy, uh, the target seems to vary between two degrees increase in global temperatures and 1.5 degrees. And it, the references in the policy memorandum switch from one to the other. So wh which one is it? What are we aiming for here? Are we, are we aiming for a world that's 1.5 degrees warmer or two degrees warmer? Because there is a big difference in terms of the impact on our economy, the impact on nature, the impact on the environmental systems that sustain us. Yeah, there certainly is a big big difference. I think that the wording of the Paris Agreement, and I'm hoping Tom will correct me if I get this wrong, is to aim for well below two degrees and to for, um, agree to efforts to, uh, to, to, to near 1.5. 
Yeah, to pursue further efforts limited to 1.5 degrees. So why is there a reference to two, two temperature targets in your bill? Well, because the Paris Agreement references two targets. It references trying to keep temperatures well below two degrees and to nearer 1.5 degrees. Right, so what, so what is the target then? Is it well for, below? Is it 1.5? Is it 1.6? Is it, is it two and then going back to 1.5? I'm not really clear what we're aiming for here. I'm not clear what... I, think that, I don't think we can be any more clear than what's given in the Paris Agreement and the way that we... Are you wanting to come in, Tom? Tom would like to come in. So the... Kind of the defining central concept in the 2009 Act is Scotland's kind of fair contribution to avoiding dangerous climate change. It's put in those terms. It's not put in terms of two degrees, which would have been the concept that was predominant back in 2008. Um, nor is it put in terms of 1.5 degrees. Now, I think one way that the Paris Agreement can be understood is that that's kind of revised the interpretation of what dangerous climate change means. Um, but the, yes, the, neither the 2009 Act nor the new bill has one of those temperature targets kind of placed numerically at its heart. What, what is at its heart is the idea of avoiding dangerous climate change. And the, the subject that we that the ministers requested advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change on was on appropriate targets to, to, meet, that, to meet that objective. Be clear what the differences are between a world that's warming at 2 degrees and a world that's warming at 1.5 degrees in terms of impact on the environment, people, community, nations around the world? I think we are sufficiently clear on that, yes, and we do understand the need and the purpose of the Paris Agreement being to limit temperature rise to well below two degrees. Right. Can okay. I just add one further mm. thing? So in their original advice on the, the target levels for the bill, the CCC went, set out the two options, I'm sure you recall, for the remaining at 80% for now or going to a stretch target of 90%. And the, um, yeah, so the CCC's advice on those two options was that the 80% Kind of remained in line with a two degree goal, but that the 90% will be more in line with a 1.5 degree goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, IPCC report coming out in October might paint a very different picture about what is dangerous and what's not dangerous. It may do. We await the report. Okay. John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. And uh, can I ask you? Um, have a lot updating the targets without updating all the activities and duties in the 2009 Act produced the best results and why was increased target setting considered without also considering what will be required to meet the targets? Uh, so, sorry, can I ask you to repeat that? How will updating the targets without updating all the activities and duties in the 2009 Act produce the best results? Why was increased target setting considered without also considering what will be required to meet the targets? Gotcha, thank you. Um, so the, the purpose of the bill, um, the, the scope of the bill is a decision for ministers and it was very much um, made in light of the Paris Agreement and ministers' um, enthusiasm and commitment to be at the limits of ambition and to be keeping up to date, um, indeed at the forefront of the global response to climate change and the global response to the Paris Agreement. Um, so the, the sort of raison d'etre of, um, of the bill is to increase the target levels. Um, we've taken the opportunity as well to improve some elements of the current act, which have proven to be particularly problematic, um, namely the ETS adjustment, which we do every year and causes no end of confusion, not least amongst ourselves. Um, so we're keen to remove the particularly problematic areas um, of the Act. But otherwise, um, there is a strong feeling that the, that the Act is working. The framework that we have in Scotland is achieving a great deal. Um, Scotland's doing really very well 
in terms of reducing emissions. Um, the, um, the, the proof is in the pudding that the um, Act is really doing its job. So the aim is really just to increase the, the targets. Um, Sorry, here, would your contention be that in terms of the, the point that Mr Scott's making, it's the climate plan that provides the detail on how we achieve these targets? Uh, yeah, very much so. Thank you. I was taking a bit too long getting to the point. Um, so um, beyond the, the, the having the knowledge and the um, assurance that the target levels are achievable at a, at a push, a very substantial push, the, the details of how we achieve our targets need to be set out in climate change plans and will continue to be done so, and that's where we will think about activities. In that instance, is there not a disconnect here? Because you said earlier that in taking advice on setting the targets, primacy lies with the UKCCC, but the finalised draft plan was not run by the UKCCC and their advice sought on that. Do you not see a slight disconnect there? I'm not sure that I do entirely. I mean, I, I take your point, but the 2009 Act requires that the Scottish ministers seek advice from the UKCCC on target levels and the appropriate target levels, mm -hmm. um, and that the um, ministers then make proposals on the target levels, and those are agreed by Parliament. However, the, um, the way in which um, those targets are met, the policies and proposals that are put in place are done under um, a sort of section of the framework which is um, slightly distinct, i.e. in strategic climate change plans um, produced by the government, scrutinised by the committee, um, revised accordingly. It's a, it's a slightly different process. Yeah, but um, I think the principle is the same. If the UKCCC is the advisor on one element of this, surely it would have been reasonable to run the final proposals. And I realise we've come past that uh -huh. point. I just make the point there that on the one hand you're saying the UKCCC is terribly important, and on the other, a few months ago, they weren't important enough to go back and run the final plan passed. Well, I, I, I don't think that I would agree um, that they were not important enough to run the... Um, to run the plan past. Um, it's more that we see that they're, they're rolled slightly differently in having that overarching um, say on target levels and appropriateness of target levels, but how those target levels are, are delivered and met is, is a matter for the Scottish Ministers. Okay. Mr Scott, apologies. Um, thank you. Um, it will be important, the practical aspect of that, because the, the goals achieved thus far, while good, um, some might argue are the low-hanging fruit. Um, and therefore, it, it's easy to declare ambitions, and we all have ambitions, of course, but the strategic delivery of those ambitions uh, will be, be much welcomed if the government give advice on how that is best to be achieved, particularly to the sectors most needing to, as it were, get their house in order. Um, has there been, further to that, has there been any review and evaluation of how other parts of the 2009 Act are working? And if not, why not? Um, our f focus has really been on bringing forward a bill that raises the ambition of the targets um, to meet the Paris Agreement um, and correcting, um, correcting, yes, improving elements of the um, Act which are um, evidently and demonstrably not functioning. Um, we have not looked to the full scope of the Act because um, we consider that it is working well enough. Okay. Thank you. So, in that case, then, you have obviously been reviewing the 2009 Act and looking at the bits that don't work adequately, so thank you very much for that. So, if it's the government's view that the best place to update policies and proposals is in the climate change plans, why did the most recent climate change plan not address issues such as specific policy proposals based on the first year of mandatory public sector reporting and the interaction with the land use strategy? as suggested in the committee's report and the draft plan. Um, public sector reporting and the land use strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with apologies, none of us were involved in depth in the development of the plan. It is my understanding that the land use, st the land use strategy um, is incorporated into the plan that the two are intertwined um, and that that is set out in the plan. 
Um, I'm not sure about the public sector um, reporting element or what the committee's recommendation was on that, I'm afraid. Um, we did um, lay in Parliament the report that's required under the Act, which sets out how all the recommendations from the committee were considered um, and responded to. Um, so that information is available and we'll be able to find it and um, return to you with a fuller answer. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Angus MacDonald. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as we know, the uh, sections one to four uh, allow for the creation of a net zero emissions target at a future date. Um, and of course, uh, we look forward to seeing um, the responses to the, the consultation over the summer on that. Um, and also, the, the, up, the sections one to four updates the 2009 Act uh, 2050 target from 80% to 90%. So, with, uh, with regard to that, can you give the committee any international actions or examples of, of how the Paris Agreement has been translated into domestic law? And can you also tell us uh, how the Scottish Government has taken account of international best practice? Uh, yes, I can endeavour to do that. We have looked um, a fair amount at international examples of good practice. We've focused um, on countries, states and regions that are um, that, that, that we know to be leading um, and that we know to have particularly good practice. Um, we've found the work to be horrendously complicated and difficult to draw comparisons between different countries' um, actions, commitments and legislations. Um, countries, states and regions differ in terms of starting points, um, assets available to them, as well as the legislation, sort of, um, and trying to understand our own legislation is um, testing. Trying to understand other countries' legislation is exceptionally testing. Um, however, we have put a lot of time and effort into it, and we have discussed um, with officials in several other countries, and we've also um, commissioned work through Climate Exchange at the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation to look at examples of best practice and can make those reports um, av available to you. I mean, they're in the public domain, but we can um, draw your attention to them specifically. Um, what we what we concluded from that work is that the the existing act. Um, even more so with the provisions in the bill, um, I mean that Scotland, as far as we're being able to to um, to tell, does have and will have the most stringent and tightly bound um, climate change emissions reduction legislation of of anywhere, so far as we can tell. And we're also ranking very um, highly in terms of progress. So while other um, leading countries have slightly different approaches. Um, ministers have taken the view that the approach that we have in Scotland is working for Scotland, um, and um, there is some reluctance to to make the changes in the legislation that would um, make our legislation more similar to other countries, um, for the simple reason that our legislation does appear to be working for Scotland and is right for Scotland um, and is a result of the 2009 Act agreed by the Parliament unanimously. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's good to hear. Um, with regard to uh, behaviour change, um, what's the, the difference in the actions uh, uh, um, and behaviour change required to attain net zero emissions, uh, a 90% reduction and the current 80% commitment? And, and what scale of behaviour change uh, and uh, technical advancement does each require, and in which sectors? Oh, um, crikey, that's really quite complicated. Um, the work that we've done to explore the difference between um, an 80% target and a 90% target, I'm very happy to set that out. I'm not quite sure that it would answer your question in the level of detail that you um, that I think that you're looking for. What we haven't done um, and that we couldn't sensibly do out to 2050 is a, is a detailed plan for exactly how we would manage the emissions reductions. 
um, within and across sectors um, and the precise contents of policies and um, actions that the government and other actors would need to put in place. What we do know about 90% target is that there's there's no level, there's no um, scope for underachievement anywhere. I think that's the term that the Committee on Climate Change used. Um, I would phrase that slightly dif differently um, and say that we need the maximum level of decarbonisation possible in every sector to achieve a 90% target. Um, the, the work to consider exactly what that means in terms of policies and actions and when is something that we would need to consider in the production of climate change plans for the reasons previously um, covered. Um, so, yeah, on, the, on that basis, I'm not sure if me telling you about what we think the difference between 80 and 90 would be, would be particularly helpful, but I can go on to that if you'd like me to. I, I think it would, and I think we'd also be interested to understand if the decision that was reached in relation to this bill was in any way influenced by what we thought people would accept by way of behavioural change. What was achievable in reality with the public, which also feeds into the consideration of the legislation elsewhere, where perhaps the cultures of those countries make that legislation suitable for there, but perhaps not or deemed not to be suitable for here. So could you can I give us a, a wider view on, on how you arrived at this? Uh, yeah, I, I can I can try to. I think it's a really really interesting question. Um, so the I'll start by saying what the Committee on Climate Change set out in their advice, because in their sort of central ambition um, scenario, um, which would meet an eighty percent target, um, and the ninety percent scenario, which is their high ambition scenario, the main the main difference between those two scenarios are in the level of the carbon sink from um, Lulu CF land use, uh, land use change and forestry. Um, in make sure I'm reading this correctly, in buildings and industry, oh, and aviation and shipping, crucial as well. Um, so under a uh, um, an 80% scenario, there is a little bit of wriggle room around the um, other sectors. Under a 90% scenario, there's basically no wriggle room anywhere, um, but there are some remaining emissions from aviation and shipping, including international, which is something that's included in um, our targets that aren't included in other countries' targets. Um, also, industry um, beyond... Um, emission reductions that can be achieved through efficiency. And what was the other one I said? Buildings, yes, we'd need to completely decarbonise buildings rather than um, almost completely decarbonise all buildings. Um, so so those, are, those are really the differences. So we considered that the way we could go further than that um, there are sort of three options for going further than that. One option is to purchase international credits to make up the difference um, of what could be achieved domestically um, and what cannot be done responsibly in the view of ministers. Um, sort of at this stage, hoping that um, technology will develop, particularly negative emissions technology will develop um, at a pace and a rate and to a scale which... Uh, um, experts tell us isn't likely in the near future. Um, and then the th third way is to introduce policies and proposals to remove emissions from aviation, shipping, agriculture. I didn't mention agriculture. Agriculture is crucial. Um, and um, aviation, shipping, agriculture, and industry completely, yes. So when you talk about behaviour change, <laughs> I'm not sure the distinction between sort of individual choices that individuals can make to change their own behaviour and um, sort of wholesale changes to the economy, which would um, require and would impose changes on behaviour. Um, but I think 
that I'm answering your question if I say that there it was a view, um, and there remains a view that it wouldn't be acceptable to the majority to impose policies that restrict um, aviation, shipping and agriculture, food production and industry at the levels that would be required for a net zero target at this time. Okay. Um, I'm going to allow some colleagues back in on this in a minute, but Angus MacDonald, do you have any further questions? No. Uh, Corey Beam is followed by Mark Roscoe. Right. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you all. Um, could I um, ask you, uh, whoever feels it's appropriate to answer, a little bit more detail about the advances in technology? Um, uh, Sarah, you said that the, um, the second uh, way in which it could be considered that we could go further with the targets um, would be um, hoping technology will deliver further. And I wonder if you could tell us something about who the experts were that have been consulted on this, because obviously beyond... Uh, 2040, it's very difficult to know what will be there. On the other hand, um, many stakeholders have said to me uh, that um, uh, it's important to be aspirational and determined to send a clear message to researchers and to investors and to the markets about where we're going. And that, in my understanding of it, although I, I was not in the parliament, unlike my colleague um, Stuart Stevenson at the time, that that bill was um, quite aspirational about where, where we were going. Yes, so... so experts. Sorry, it's rather long-winded, but I'm trying to <laughs> set a bit of a scene for things that people have been coming to me uh -huh. with concerns about why we're not going further. OK. Um, so the reason why we're not going further, even though ministers and Scottish governments are absolutely clear um, that we do wish to achieve net zero um, as soon as possible, is that to put a target into legislation just now requiring us to achieve net zero by a specific date um, could create difficulties if the technology doesn't arrive um, at the pace or at the scale that's necessary to achieve that. Um, and it may do, and some people are very optimistic that that technology will come on stream um, very, very soon and be able to be rolled out on industrial scale. However, others are substantially less optimistic and it, is, uh, it, would, be a, it would be a bet, essentially, um, on whether the technology um, will be available um, at the scale needed. Um, so it's by, by setting out a clear ambition to achieve net zero um, in a similar manner to many other countries have done, I, sort of with a political commitment rather than a legislative commitment, um, I think it could be argued that um, ministers are making that aspiration clear and sending that message to investors, to researchers, to um, to those people who you know need to be encouraged or benefit from being encouraged to um, uh, develop technology and um, the business case for the technology even further. But putting the, a, a target date in legislation um, that we absolutely have to meet, um, regardless of whether that technology becomes available, is a, is a different um, is a different kettle of fish altogether. In terms of the experts, um, that again was primarily the Committee on Climate Change, who do have the technology expertise as well as all the other expertise, um, but also discussions with um, colleagues and stakeholders in other parts of the organisation who are involved in those kind of technological developments. Which organisation? Sorry, I'm just not sure what you mean by organisation. Yeah, and I'm not sure that I can answer the question right now, not least because I remember that we have some consultation responses about it, but what I can't remember is whether those consultees agreed to having their um, names made public in relation to what they said. So I'm being a little bit cagey about that just now, but I'm really happy to come back to it um, later. Check yeah, absolutely. That out. Uh -huh. Thank you. Right. Thank but, you. But you see, here's the thing some people would see a contradiction around technology. And I appreciate what you said about that you guys weren't involved in the climate plan, but the original climate plan relied, to a fair extent, on a technology like carbon capture and storage. And we were told it was a credible plan with that in it. Here we are in a situation where we were told, we can't be more ambitious because we don't have the technologies. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see the contradiction that some people see there in approach? 
Um, well, when you put it like that, yes. I think if the Cabinet Secretary um, was here, she would comment that um, she uh, was criticised quite a lot for um, making those comments and relying on... Um, so you could um, turn the argument around the other way as well, which I won't do because I'm not the Cabinet Secretary. Um, what I would say is it's about, it's about scale and pace of technology. Um, and it's, it's one thing to... Um, to expect, uh, to rely on, and to to um, sort of plan for a, for a level of technological development, um, it, it's quite another to, to think that the, the the scale of that could be vast enough, quick enough to achieve a substantially more um, ambitious target. Okay, thank you. It's useful to get that on the record. Um, you want to come back very briefly, and then Mark Roscoe right afterwards. I'll come on if Mark, I mean, if Mark doesn't ask what I want to ask, I have no idea what he's going to ask, but just... <laughs> OK, sorry, we're all, we're all keen to get in on this. Um, I, I just want to pick up on, on something that you said, so you said it was a, a bet on technology, uh, but there's bets on the other side as well. If we don't meet climate change targets, if the science around climate change uh, changes and it becomes a more worsening situation, we're taking a bet on the future there as well. So I'm just wondering, I mean, how do we... How do we refocus on technological change? Because if you think back, say, 32 years ago, 1986, roughly the same kind of time scale that we're being now asked to look forward to with 2050, we had no idea in 1986 that the internet was going to be a thing. And yet here we are today rolling out broadband strategies. You know, the internet's completely transformed our, our world. So how do you learn from previous technological changes? and the conditions and the kind of market conditions and the conditions around innovation and university uh, innovation, uh, investment, uh, research. How do you create the conditions to give us the certainty going forward that we can make those technological changes? What does government need to do now, even though it doesn't have all the answers, to create the conditions where the answers can be brought forward? Because to be honest, back in 1986, we didn't, we didn't have a clue that we were gonna be here. There were, there were certainly technologists that were saying we might be here, but the exact pathway to delivering the kind of transformative change that the internet has, has given us today wasn't, wasn't clear. Indeed, you're putting me in mind of uh, Tomorrow's World, which I used to watch. Um, when you kind of see re repeats of that, it's really quite remarkable what people thought might um, become standard technology. Uh, hovercrafts uh, spring to mind. Um, I, I really don't think that I can answer your question about, um, about sort of the changing landscape. I mean, I agree with you completely that we don't, that technology will develop and the world will change. Um, of course it will. Um, the point is that we, we really don't know how and we really don't know when and we really don't, don't know what the implications and the impact of that will be. Um, and putting targets into legislation with, with all that unknowability is, is very complex. Tom, do you want to come in on the broader issue? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, apologies, I can't remember which of you it was that mentioned it, but I think carbon capture and storage is a kind of a good, a good example to think about in this space. And indeed, uh, one thing that's clear from the CCC's advice on the bill targets is that it won't just be a question of carbon capture and storage. We have to even go beyond that and end up with this thing called bioenergy carbon capture and storage, where you use carbon capture and storage coupled with the production of biomass to actually reach negative emissions. So regular carbon capture and storage gets you to reduced emissions, but to actually get to negative emissions, you need to go even beyond that. So there's kind of there's two steps of technological uncertainty there. There's getting to functional deployment of CCS, and then there's getting to functional deployment of bioenergy CCS. Um, the observation I was going to make on this is that whilst Scotland can and does have kind of research excellence in many of these areas, these are really big technologies that will only be effectively developed and deployed at kind of multinational scale. They're, they're, on some level, they're simply beyond the scope of what a, a small country can unilaterally do. The costs involved in these technologies are very large. The research kind of consortia are very, are very large. So. It's, it's an area where kind of international partnership working for Scotland is really important, but where we are also, to a certain extent, just simply limited by the pace of development internationally. 
Um, the, the second thing I was just going to offer as an observation is, um, as I'm sure everybody here is well aware, one of the key features of the 2009 Act that's being carried forward into the Bill is the principle that we keep on getting updated advice on all of these matters, and technology will be one of the key things where that updated advice will be most, most important, along with the climate science that, that Mark Ruskell has spoken about earlier. So the, the Bill will require that the UK Committee on Climate Change provides updated advice on all of these matters at least every five years. And including target levels. Including, yeah, inc including on the target levels that then follow from, from these considerations. And the, the, yeah, the, I think we, we're quite frank in acknowledging the valid validity of the point that technology is extremely uncertain. The, the examples that we've talked through kind of really illustrate that. But advice every five years kind of seems about the right timescale to keep checking back in on those, de those developments. And if things happen even more rapidly than that five-year timescale, the, the, the Act and the Bill allow for the possibility that ministers can go back to the UK Committee on Climate Change even sooner and say, well, yes, you know, we seem to have crossed some, some tipping point here around CCS or, or what have you, and, you know, can we have updated advice right now? OK, I think colleagues want to come in with some supplementaries here, slightly going off from this. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Um, I think this is uh, almost certainly for Callum Webster, perhaps for Mark Egling, and it's in relation to an answer that... Uh, uh, Sarah Granger gave to my colleague John Scott. Uh, she said the bill is about numbers and reporting uh, and that it's working satisfactorily. As the Minister who took the previous bill now act through, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, i just give an example, uh, and that is Alec Johnson's amendment to allow discounts on business rates for premises that were upgraded, and Sarah Boyack's uh, amendment on domestic in the same way. I don't think these work terribly well. The, the question is, given that the Act is labelled emissions reduction targets and says an Act for setting targets and make provision about advice plans and reports in relation to these targets, is it amendable to allow it to amend these previous very worthy attempts which haven't delivered on what we hoped? Uh, and other bits of it that would help us put into primary legislation things that would be part of plans in relation to these targets. Is it amendable? That's kind of my question. Yeah, right. um, these are uh, matters ultimately for the Parliament to make a decision on, um, and, and including um, the convening of the committee at stage two in terms of amendments. Um, there has been exchanges in terms of um, consideration as to what the scope of the bill is, um, but as I say, that, that's for Parliament. Um, ultimately, though, what the bill is doing is amending principally Part 1 of the 2009 Act, which is focused on uh, targets, um, and it's also amending some of the provisions uh, relating to reporting, including the um, uh, reporting in relation to the climate change plan. So that's the focus. So the focus is all around the targets. Um, and those targets are obviously targets imposed on Scottish ministers. So it's very much focused on that as well. Um, what it's not doing at all is looking at any delivery measures or parts of, of the 2009 Act that deal with how you implement and give effect to those targets. There are obviously a suite of existing powers in the 2009 Act, and there's lots of other powers in other Acts to enable provision to be made to deliver various targets. But the principle here is that the climate change plans will set out uh, what, what measures need to be taken and what proposals are being put forward for any additional uh, measures that need to be taken forward, and that can be looked at at that time to see whether the powers are already in place to do that or whether anything more is, is required. Right, to close it off very briefly, the Parliament would have the capability of allowing amendments, which would be debated, passed or failed, um, that, that, that change some of the, the legislative... It, some of the... The 2009 Act creates certain powers 
and we could amend that by this mechanism, subject to the convener and the presiding officer allowing that to happen. Just, um, it's a pure legal question, not one for a long answer. Yeah, it's not, um, um, we've, we've expressed our view on, on the scope of the bill, and um, I, I understand that there, there are precedents for how that's handled within, within parliaments. It's not for me. We'll let the convener worry about that at another date. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, convener. Um, I've got a question about something that isn't in the bill, which um, our committee has received submission on from the Just Transition Partnership, and which I've been in discussion with, with the STUC and others, and no doubt others. Um, around this table and beyond have as well. That is about the, um, the Just Transition Commission. And while I take um, the point that um, Mark Egling, sorry, I can't read the, so, yeah, I've got it right, um, has said about the, the targets, my clear understanding of this bill is that it's a governance bill as well. And, um, and I, I would like to know um, if there are reasons that can be explained today as to why that's not there in that, giving a legislative um, status to the Just Transition Commission, um, in the view of many, would, um, going right forward towards 2050 and beyond, would give a clear indication or, and reassurance to people in affected communities and in affected industries as to um, how the shift will be done and that that will be done fairly and that it could be accountable to Parliament. Uh, so the... Thinking about the scope, um, the remit and the form and function of the Just Transition Commission is is very live conversation that's happening just now within Scottish Government, and um, there will be um, that, that 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 discussion will be opened up very very shortly. Um, the current thinking is that um, it's not. It, is that it, it may not be necessary for the Just Transition to be Commission to be established in statute for it to be able to provide its um, for it to be able to provide the valuable advice to Scottish ministers about how to ensure a just transition to a low carbon economy. Um, however, the the um, the, th the thinking hasn't stopped; it remains live, um, and there will be more information. Um, in the near future. So what's the reasoning, um, if you could tell us please, as to why um, it, it is being considered as not necessary at the moment, because it would seem clearly to um, a lot of um, organisations, trade unions and indeed companies, that it would give clarity about arrangements for the future on a legislative basis. So is there the a reason why that would not be the case? Um, so the the purpose of the Just Transition Commission, as was set out in the programme for government, is to provide advice to ministers um, to um, help them devise policies and processes to ensure a just transition. Um, it's not evident that a statutory basis is required for a commission to be established to provide valuable advice. <coughs> not required, no, but possibly valuable. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's move this on. Um, Richard, Richard Lyle. Uh, good morning. Uh, can I turn to <coughs> targets? <coughs> pardon, pardon me. Amongst the main themes of the Scottish Government consultation were whether the bill should contain provisions to allow for a net zero emission target to be set at a later date, to update the interim target for 2020 contained in the 2009 Act from 42% to 56% lower than baseline levels, to add further interim targets 66% from 2030 and 78% by 2040, and updating the 2050 target from 80% to 90% lower than baseline levels. In your opinion, in light of that, in your opinion, what scenarios might change, require changes to these suggested interim targets and what are the practical implications? Tom? Yes, thank you for the question. If it's all right, I'll start off with a slightly process-based answer and then go on to some hypothetical scenarios. So, as you say, the, the bill allows for the, uh, the interim and indeed for the 2050 target level uh, to be modified through uh, affirmative procedure secondary legislation. Now, the, the process element of my answer is before that might happen, a 
a couple of things have to happen first. So, first of all, the UK Committee on Climate Change has to provide advice on, uh, on the, those target levels. And in providing that advice, I think this has been touched on previously, it, it provides that advice with reference to a defined set of what are termed target setting criteria. It's quite a long list, so I'm not going to try and recount it from memory, but that it includes factors such as a, uh, the concept of a f fair and safe total emissions budget over the period to 2050, the best uh, available climate science that we've spoken about previously, technological circumstances, economic and fiscal circumstances here in Scotland, uh, impacts on rural and island communities, to name but a few. The list is, uh, as I say, quite lengthy. So the UK Committee on Climate Change provides regular advice on target levels with reference to those criteria. Uh, the Scottish ministers are then required to have due regard both to the committee's advice, but uh, also to their own assessment against that same list of criteria. And if ministers view upon reflecting on both those things is that they think that interim or 2050 targets should be modified, uh, either upwards or downwards, they can uh, propose to the Parliament that that should occur, uh, and then uh, the final decision will be a matter for the Parliament to take. So apologies for the slightly long preamble, but I hope this is helpful in kind of then getting into what, what, what circumstances, what scenarios might lead to modification actually happening. And I think in a sense, I hope that that groundwork kind of points us back to the set of target setting criteria in that if circumstances either internationally or here in Scotland uh, change with respect to those criteria, then that would be the likely basis upon which uh, a change to the targets could be made. Um, these are necessarily entirely hypothetical examples and that I'm foreguessing the future and the uh, advice of the Committee on Climate Change and the will of ministers, all of which I shouldn't be foreguessing. Um, but to give two kind of potential scenarios, um, one of which is Mark Ruskell has spoken about the forthcoming report, scientific report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That will inevitably update the best understanding of the available climate science. That's one of the target setting criteria. If that substantially changes the UK Committee on Climate Change's view as to what Scotland's goals should be, they would presumably provide advice to that effect. Um, a second example, which I um, well, perhaps will try and explore in a little bit more detail, is um, the question of how we, how we measure the greenhouse gas emissions that Scotland is actually producing at any given point in time. This is uh, what's often referred to as the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, it's referred to in the bill as international carbon reporting practice, and it's also one of the, the target setting criteria. Uh, and as, as uh, members will recall, this is something that's kind of changing all the time. And when that changes, that can change the, um, the effective level of ambition needed to, needed to deliver kind of a given, a given target level. And one can imagine future scenarios whereby if that, if that measurement science changes very radically and we suddenly find out that Scotland's always been emitting either much greater or much lower levels of emissions than we previously understood, this might form the basis for the UK Committee on Climate Change providing advice that the target level should be modified to keep them in line with the, with the decarbonisation pathway. It sounds to me as we're going to be changing our target levels or our targets uh, every so often. And it's a question I've got to ask. Why is the ability to lower as well as raise targets critical to the operation of the target framework proposed by the Committee on Climate Change? And are we not, not just playing with figures to satisfy political parties and outside organisations? I hope you'll appreciate it. I'm going to struggle to answer the second part of that question. Um, I genuinely don't think it's the case that we are playing with figures for the sake of playing with figures. Um, much as we as officials might enjoy doing that, that's not, that's, not, that's not what's at stake here. These are very... They are figures, but they're figures with very real practical implications on the ground, in that the targets are the basis upon which the climate change plans are produced. The climate change plans must set out to meet those targets, and the plans contain a whole range of very practical on-the-ground measures that affect 
everybody's day-to-day -day lives. So going back to the, the first part of your question, why, why is the ability to modify targets downwards as well as upwards essential to the, the CCC's advice? This, this relates actually directly to the second of the two examples I, uh, I tried to give previously, which relates to this question of the, the measurement science about how we measure emissions is changing all the time. And the experience we've had with the 2009 Act is that that can change in either direction. We can either find out that we've always had a lot more emissions than we thought, or that we have a lot less emissions than we previously thought. And it's, broadly speaking, unpredictable on a year-to-year -year basis which way those changes will go. And those changes are entirely, or I should say almost entirely, outside the hands of the Scottish Government. The decisions are made at a UK level in line with UN guidelines. These are things that, in, in kind of crude terms, happen, happen to us and we have to respond to. Um, modifying target levels in response to this is very much a last resort. We definitely wouldn't want to be modifying target levels too often. Clearly, an important part of the function of targets is to provide a long-term signalling function, and if you keep on adjusting them, it undermines that function. But if really big changes to our best understanding of the current emissions levels keep on occurring, then it may be necessary at some future point to adjust. And because those measurement changes can go in either direction, it's a totally policy kind of neutral thing. At this level, it is, it's purely kind of technocratic, if you will. Um, that is why the CCC advises that it's important to have the flexibility to go in both ways with the targets. Thank you. For well, the targets in more detail in a moment, Mark Russell got a brief supplementary. To, to what extent regulatory alignment with the European Union is important here? Because, as you know, there's growing calls for a, a net zero carbon target in the EU. And, in fact, the, the European Parliament's uh, lead negotiator on energy uh, recently said that countries which resist the EU-wide proposal on net zero carbon by 2050 will be in the same camp as Mr Trump. So there's clearly a, a political drive from the Parliament, the Commission's looking at net zero carbon, uh, that's where we may end up. Where does that place Scotland with our policy of regulatory alignment? Um, the, the, because of the, what, well, partly because of um, the reasons that Tom was explaining earlier about um, the need for sort of multinational action and development of technologies, um, it's, it's incredibly important what's happening in other countries about how uh, achievable and how sensible it is for Scotland to have one target or another. Um, the other reason it's, it's particularly important is around the, the risk of carbon leakage. And well, I'm sure you're all aware, but just to save anyone the embarrassment of um, having to ask, because I didn't know for quite a long time. Carbon leakage is, is when um, businesses relocate to other countries with um, lesser, um, more, more lax regulations or, or lower targets. Um, and if, 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 so if one country has a substantially higher target, um, tougher regulations than surrounding countries, um, that can be quite, have quite a negative um, economic impact um, and affect the availability of jobs so on and so forth. It can also result in um, products being imported um, rather than manufactured um, within the country. So for all of those reasons, um, what's happening in the rest of Europe, um, in the rest of the UK, and indeed the rest of the world is extremely important and um, is an important, con yeah, is a, is a central consideration to what target levels in Scotland should be. Very briefly, Stuart Stevenson. Um, just to confirm again that the plans that we have encompassed in the bill represent a net zero carbon target for 2050 and that the 10 percentage points difference between 90% and 100% relate entirely to the five gases other than carbon, of which the predominant one would be methane. That's correct. Thank you. It's quite important to get that on the record because there is a misunderstanding about that out there. There is a misunderstanding um, 
about that out there, and I really appreciate you raising it. Um, my understanding of the um, conversation in Europe um, is that there there is not yet an a, agreed definition of, of what's being talked about when net zero is being talked about. Um, when carbon neutrality is talked about across different countries, um, it seems to mean very different things, with some people meaning it means net zero CO2 and others thinking it means net zero greenhouse gases. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's very important. Thank you. Okay. Because credibility and trust in what's out there is, is really important. So to which end? How will changing to percentage targets deliver better scrutiny and improve performance? It's another one of Tom's favourite subjects. <laughs> so this is one of the key what we would see as kind of the technical improvements going on uh, in the bill. So, again, if I can beg the committee's patience, I'll provide a tiny bit of background on kind of how we've got to this point. I do think it helps. I hope it helps, anyway. So, uh, under the 2009 Act, emissions reduction targets are set in two different forms. So, there's the 2020 target and the 2050 target, which are set as percentage reductions from baselines. 42% and 80% respectively. And there's then the annual targets that basically fill in all the gaps between those years. And those are set as fixed amounts of emissions, so megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent to the, to the third decimal place. Um, now, there are, there are definitely pros and cons that come with both percentage-based targets and fixed amount of emissions-based targets. I think it's fair to say that one... One difficulty that wasn't foreseen at the time of the 2009 Act is the potential that if you have the targets in the two different forms, that they can end up kind of getting out of skew with each other. Uh, and the, the, the thing which drives them in becoming out of skew with each other are these changes to the measurement science, changes to the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, those changes affect kind of the achievability of both target, both types of targets, but it affects them in a different way. In general, the fixed amount targets are much more sensitive to those changes than the percentage-based targets. Um, so one consequence of having two different types of targets is they've got misaligned with one another, and this leads to some really, um, both for us and I suspect for stakeholders, some real difficulties. So, for example, at the moment, the, the clearest example of this is there are actually two different targets for 2020. Um, at different levels, it's quite conceivable that Scotland could end up meeting one and missing one, uh, and that would clearly be kind of very, very hard to explain and quite counterproductive to credibility, which we would very much agree is absolutely central here. So that's quite a long-winded way of saying that one of the key reasons for shifting to percentage-based targets is to get all the targets in the same form. Um, we, think that's, we think that's really important. Um, now, the question could be asked, why percentages? Why not put everything into fixed amounts? That would equally well address the point that, I, that I've just talked through. So, why percentages? I think there's, there's, there's three main reasons why percentages rather than fixed amounts. As I said, there are some pros and cons the other way as well. If you're interested, we can go into those in more detail. But the three main arguments in favour of percentages is, in general, these are more stable to the changes in the measurement science. Um, because most of those changes affect not just current emissions, but emissions all the way back to the baseline, if what you're doing is taking a relative difference from the baseline to the present day, some of those changes cancel out within the targets. So they tend to be more stable to the changing measurement science. I think uh, the second reason is, I think for most of us, we find them to be more transparent. I think this is, this is ultimately a subjective judgment. Some people prefer to think in terms of fixed amounts of emissions. They find that more intuitive. Other people find percentages more intuitive. Um, the vast majority of the, uh, the respondents to the consultation on this favoured the percentage target option. Uh, certainly, I find 80% or 90% easier to kind of relate to than 52.392 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. But that is ultimately a subjective, subjective judgment. And then the third reason is this, uh, this is the approach that the UK Committee on Climate Change advised that government take. Their view is that the percentage-based targets are... Um, yeah, more transparent and more and more stable. It was terribly useful to get that on the record, and thank you for that. But 
another layman's question, if you like. So as I understand it, um, using percentages, we would have had to have removed an additional four megatons of greenhouse gases by 2020. So are we going to do that? Not entirely, with apologies, I'm not entirely sure I follow the question. So is this the difference between the annual and interim targets for well, 2020? As I understand it, you would have, the original, on the original baseline, uh, we would have had to have removed 40.717 megatons, that would have been 42%. Now we know we would have had to remove 44.713 megatons. So, daft laddie question, are we going to do that? Uh, yes, we absolutely are, uh, is, the, is the daft laddie answer. Um, so, the, the climate change plans are required to meet both the annual targets and the interim and 2050 targets. The, the effect of the kind of the misalignment between the two sets of targets that we, we have to date is that the annual targets are the harder of the two. So the, the, four, the extra four megatons, as you nicely put it, uh, falls between the annual target for 2020, which is harder, and the interim target for 2020, which is now, relatively speaking, a bit, a bit easier. So the, the current climate change plan, and indeed the previous ones, have always set out to meet the tougher of the sets of targets available to them. And kind of by necessity, by doing that, you'll also meet and exceed the 42% the target. But that, that's a large demanded improvement in performance. It's about 10%. Absolutely right, yes. And what does that look like? You know, give me an example of, of a sector, for example, that, that, that the challenge could be illustrated by. So. <laughs> If memory serves correctly, four megatons is kind of of the order of emissions from the building sector per annum, of course. So that, that four is kind of the, the additional four megatons, that's kind of over a period of time. And I guess the way that I'm thinking in my head now is the, the per annum emissions. But you're absolutely right, it's a large, it's a large amount of emissions. Um, and that's reflected within the, kind of the package of policies and proposals in the, in the current and previous climate change plans. Well, one thing which the plans don't do is they don't attempt to kind of separate out those policies and proposals to say, well, these policies are for this target and these policies are for this target. Uh, so I'm afraid that means I'm a bit limited in being able to give you a nice, nice packaged answer. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. Can right, just... sorry, John Scott. I mean, is the, the business, the, the building sector or other sectors aware of this as it were, ten percent increase in target, just like that, simply by changing the unit of recognition. So, as I've said, this is this is this is something that we've 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 really struggled with. It's been one of the hardest features of the the 2009 Act to live with. In some ways, you can, I'm sure you can well imagine the challenges it gives us in speaking both to our our colleagues within government and to stakeholders outside of government, trying to explain. Why? It's, it's not quite as bad as they suddenly have to do it because the inventory revisions have been building up, you know, over a period of time. Um, but, yeah, this is, it, it comes back to why we think it's so important to try and um, effectively fix this element of the, the Act going forward so that there's a really clear basis, all the targets in the same form. Um, so the level of effort that's required from both, yeah, other parts of government and outside of government is well understood and is stable through time. That's, that's got to be the right way to approach policy planning. For up to five years. Uh, as Sarah says, um, I'm perhaps being a bit too bullish in my assessment of how effective this, this change will be in that the, what, what, the, what the CCC have proposed and what the bill enacts is that the inventory is basically fixed for a five year a period of up to five years. So these challenges will still arise and will be well, our successors will be back speaking to your successors <coughs> about this uh, in the future, I'm afraid. But that will happen not every year, but every five years. And that gives a bit of chance, especially for the you know, external actors who you know, do find this very opaque, I think it's fair to say, um, to kind of yeah, have a bit of stability before it comes round again. Uh, uh, and forgive me, but just to be absolutely clear, so industry and the business sector is absolutely aware of this as it were, creeping increase in target. Um, I mean, for me, it was news when I read these papers. 
Um, but I presume others are much better informed than me, so that certainly wouldn't be hard. But um, uh, it just seems to me like this is a... By changing a unit, you've increased the target mm -hmm. by 10%, and that seems an odd way of doing business. I, I obviously can't speak to what, you know, a whole bunch of external organisations um, do and don't... So you're not understand. aware that they understand this or not? Well, so the... A whole... A very wide range of stakeholders are involved in the kind of the production and consultation around climate change plans. And the, the climate change plan documents do, to my mind, set out clearly these kind of these technical changes that have happened. And as I said a few moments ago, the, the plans ultimately have to set out to meet the, the more ambitious sort of two sets of targets. So that carries with it that implication. Is it well understood? I, I don't know, I guess, is the answer. I, I, I suppose my answer is I'm not reassured that people are aware of this change. <laughs> well, you would accept that this is a perfect example of why all sectors need to carry the load, so that when significant changes like these occur, it isn't just one or two sectors that are left to, to, to deal with that. So, we, you know, this committee has highlighted one or two sectors across society that aren't being uh, asked to do a great deal. When you see changes like these, it does really bring home the need for everyone to be playing their part. I would certainly agree that a cross-sectoral approach is necessary to tackle the, um, the ambitious targets that we have and the even more ambitious targets that we're going to have. Um, if, if what you're implying, and I may be understanding you wrong, is that um, all sectors should um, have the sort of same percentage target, if you like, um, I, I'm not sure that we would agree with that. Um, at, at, at that level of detail, um, it makes quite a lot of sense from, from my perspective and from the um, Minister's perspective um, to be able to look across sectors um, and to see at different points in time what's reasonable to expect different sectors to do given you know changes in technology, emerging technology mm -hmm. and what have you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't referring to exactly the same percentage from all sectors, but perhaps some sectors doing more than they currently are. Let's move this on. Finley Carlson. We've heard about um, how the Scottish Government have taken advice, uh, particularly when it comes to percentages in terms of uh, future targets. Um, and, you know, the advice um, must take into account uh, target setting criteria. Can I ask how the target setting criteria were chosen and why they don't align more closely with the uh, climate change plan sectoral approach? Uh, yeah, so the um, target setting criteria are given in the existing act. Um, I wasn't a, around um, in 2008, so I wasn't personally involved, but it's my understanding that a, a set of criteria were consulted on in 2008. Um, I can't tell you how they were come up with, how they were arrived at in the, in the first place in order to consult on them, but I know a set of criteria were consulted on, um, that they were reconsidered um, in light of that consultation exercise, and then they were set out in the bill in 2008 and amended by Parliament um, and, and ended up as they are in the 2009 Act. Um, so we're carrying it forward in, in the bill. Um, the, the only thing we really looked at in the consultation that we ran last year for the, for the, for the current bill um, related to the first, um, sorry, where, where is it? Yes, the, the, the first criteria, the, object, the objective of not exceeding the fair and safe Scottish emissions budget, um, our our thinking internally was that um, that criterion wasn't um, was no, was no longer particularly necessary in the form that it, it was it was in um, because of the move to percentage based targets. Uh, just to be very clear on that point, there was never any suggestion that we should move away of, a, of the importance of a concept of a fair and safe. Um, Scottish emissions budget that remained absolutely um, central. However, we didn't think that the criteria in that form was necessary anymore. However, consultation responses were quite clear. Environmental stakeholder groups were really very clear um, that they did not want to lose that um, criterion in that form. They consider it very important. So the bill that we've now introduced does um, makes no change to that. 
um, moves a couple of things around. I mean, I can go into um, some detail into the uh, really quite minor changes that we've made to the wording of some of the criterion, but they, I think the answer to your question is that they come from the 2009 Act primarily. Okay. Um, just following on from that, um, can I ask, the, throughout the, the, the bill, uh, there's a term or a phrase, as soon as reasonably practical, um, and also um, uh, the Scottish Government's proposal to find achievable in relation to net uh, uh, target. Can you uh, give us some idea of uh, what reasonably practical actually means in practice? Well, um, yeah, I cannot... Uh, I can answer the question about achievable, um, and then I'll maybe pass over to my colleague to talk about as soon as reasonably practicable. Um, in terms of achievable, um, that is something that we would look to the UK Committee on Climate Change to advise us on. So they have, um, in, in their, their current advice, the advice that we're basing the, the bill on, they've been very, very clear um, and explicit that beyond going beyond 90% is not feasible. Um, it's, you know, stretches the um, stretches the bounds of credibility. So we interpret that as it's not achievable. So, so that's what we mean by achievable in terms of um, as soon as reasonably practical. Callum, can you? Um, yes, I don't think it's got a, a a formal definition in terms of it. It must be done by this time, and I think that's that part of the function of it is that it, it needs to relate to the context that it's being applied in and it's it's a term that's that's used quite extensively in in the act and I think across um, the range of of Scottish government legislation I'm looking at mark to <laughs> confirm that but um, when you when you consider what's reasonable what what do you consider depends on the, the, um, the issue it's being applied to. So if there's a requirement in the Act, that it, and it's been taken forward into the bill, that we have to publish advice from the CCC as soon as reasonably practicable, that sort of thing, I think it, it would be reasonable to think we could do on the day that we receive it. And I think that's, that's what has happened in the past. But if you, if you consider um, some of the other requirements, like the need to respond to the CCC's annual progress report. I think that requires some judgment to be applied, some information to be gathered, and it would be reasonable to expect that that would be done over a longer time period. And I think that's been something that maybe has been weeks rather than days that's been taken to, to respond to, to things like that. So I guess my answer is it, it depends on the nature of the, the task in hand. Thank you. Um, can I just issue a plea to members and the witnesses to uh, consider short, sharp questions and answers wherever possible so we can cover as much ground as we, we can today? Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, could I just um, follow up on um, my colleague Finley Car Carson's question about um, as soon as it's reasonably practicable um, and ask, uh, does uh, the information and advice uh, that you've referred to from the UK CCC have to be um, made through a statement to Parliament as the Act stands at the moment, or can it simply be put on the internet or, or published in, in some way as, as we move forward with the, with the um, five-year commitment? The in the bill is to publish the advice. There's no other requirements attached to that. I believe that's the same requirement as under the Act, but I'm... Yeah. Uh, just briefly, going back to the... Um, going back to um, the, the target-setting criteria, um, and again, building on the question uh, by my colleague, uh, it's interesting uh, that I see in the, um, in the Act itself that the target-setting target criteria under Section 5, um, that there are 11 of those, and uh, it does, one of them does refer specifically to energy, um, 
And while I not that some I, and E does actually refer to economic circumstances. So within the economic circumstances, it does refer to um, more broadly to business. But why is energy particularly picked out rather than, say, agriculture or transport or whatever? It seems a bit of a sort of, uh, not arbitrary, because energy is very important, I, not that word, but it seems strange. How were these criteria decided? You said they were based on the 2000. Nine Act, but my, under my understanding is there are less of them in the 2009 Act. Um, so the the criteria about energy policy is unchanged from the 2009 Act, so that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. Whether it was something that um, government um, conceived of and consulted on or whether it was um, added by amendment during the parliamentary process, I can't tell you. We can um, endeavour to find out. The thing that's been added... Um, to the criteria in the bill is a criteria um, to consider current international carbon reporting practice, um, and that's in relation to the changing to the air counting methodology that Tom has explained. So that, that's that's the uh, only sort of um, substantive change. That's the addition. So were um, other heavy emitters such as agriculture and transport considered in view of the fact that, um, following on from the 2009 Act, that energy was considered? And if not, what reason? Why have they been ruled out? Uh, we, we didn't um, look to change the criteria substantially. We, we, we accepted the criteria from the 2009 Act um, and merely made some, some min very minor changes in light of changes to um, the accounting framework and also um, in response to stakeholders' concerns that the Paris Agreement have a more explicit um, recognition. However, we, we, we didn't conduct a full review of the rest of the criteria. We accepted that um, as read from the 2009 Act. Right. So that doesn't send a, a, a message then in, in your view, if you're able to give a view, uh, that some sectors are more important than others in terms of heavy emitters? Uh, that's certainly not the intended I, message. I, I completely appreciate that. <laughs> that's not <laughs> what I'm implying at all. No. Okay. Thank you. Very briefly, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I just wondered, and it's probably Mark uh, Egling again, um, that uh, in relation to energy, we have very, we virtually no legislative competence. We have administrative devolution of sections 36 and 37 of the 1989 Act, and that therefore we need to be quite cautious about how we legislate in relation to, uh, to energy. Is that a fair characterisation of the situation? Um, yes, there's, um, there's a number of reservations in relation to energy matters, um, but there are areas of devolved competence in, in this area, including promotion of um, energy efficiency and the like. Um, so there are things that can be done within devolved competence in this area, and those are the sort of things that, uh, where necessary, they'd be picked up in a climate change plan. Uh, John Scott. Thank you so much. Convener, uh, can I take you now to emissions accounting, please, and ask you for a clear explanation of how emissions accounting is being amended and how the proposed 20% limit is calculated? And briefly. Yes, I may struggle against the, the brief steer here. Um, <laughs> so, very briefly, by way of background, under the 2009 Act, emissions accounting establishes primarily two mechanisms by which what are termed carbon units. So, begging your patience, carbon units are um, kind of internationally recognised carbon credits, which can be bought or sold, effectively. Um, and what they represent is a kind of, yeah, a degree of recognised confidence that some action will be undertaken somewhere to reduce emissions by a specified amount. So, the... The 2009 Act provides for two mechanisms by which carbon units can be used to contribute towards uh, meeting the targets for Scotland. Um, the two ways are an adjustment to reflect the operation of the EU emissions trading scheme in Scotland. That's something that happens automatically every year within the current carbon accounting. Um, so the EU ETS operates within Scotland. Um, companies are the actors within that. Um, they report their emissions and, if necessary, buy permits within the, within the EU emissions trading scheme. 
Um, and then at the end of each year, kind of an adjustment is applied to Scottish emissions to reflect the operation of that scheme. The, the second mechanism, I think, is actually more intuitively clear, and that's the possibility that Scottish ministers may themselves purchase international carbon units as a way of offsetting Scotland's total uh, emissions. Uh, that mechanism is subject to two limits under the 2009 Act. Firstly, the domestic effort target, which um, in effect means that no more than 20% of the year-on-year -year reduction in emissions can be met through the purchase of credits by ministers. Uh, and secondly, ministers must uh, recurrently set absolute limits on the maximum amount they could use purchase units for a period kind of in advance, which rolls forward by five years each time. It's one of the many five yearly things in the sales now. To come to your question, the, the, bill, the bill changes carbon accounting in two main ways. Both of these changes are intended to uh, improve transparency and simplicity and it affects both of the existing mechanisms. So firstly, the adjustment that reflects the operation of the EU ETS is removed. Um, so that means that going forwards, that adjustment won't be applied. Emissions will be reported on the basis of actual Scottish emissions from all, from all sectors of the economy. The, the second change is that whilst the, the option for ministers to use credits that they've purchased is retained, the a new default limit um, of zero use of such credits is established. So this effectively provides a stricter limit than the existing ones. So what this reflects is the, the clear commitment of, uh, of this government to not use uh, purchase credits as a way of meeting, of meeting targets. That commitment was set out in the recent climate change plan out to at least 20, 2032, uh, and the bill yeah, the bill establishes a statutory limit of zero by default. Now, it is the, a power does exist, that limit can be raised from the zero limit. Uh, if, minister, if future ministers were to wish to do that and, and Parliament were to wish to agree through secondary procedure legislation. Uh, and this takes us on to the final part of your question, which is the 20% the limit. So if the if the limit on the purchase of carbon units were to be raised from zero, it can only be raised up to this, this figure of 20% of the year-on-year -year reduction. Um, the way that that will be calculated um, is under the bill arrangements, all of the annual targets for all future years are known. So that allows you to work out the year-on-year -year reduction in emissions that will be required for every single future year. And then you simply take that difference and multiply it by 20% to say what is the absolute maximum amount of credits that could be used in that, in that given future year. Um, the, why 20% rather than, say, 30% or 10%? So 20% is the level of the current domestic effort target under the 2009 Act. So this, in a sense, this new, this new limit provision of a default of zero, but up to 20% of... Um, if that's desired in the future, this effectively replaces the domestic effort target from the 2009 Act, and it means that the domestic effort target as now stands uh, could, not be, could not be missed in the future because the absolute most that could ever be done would be the 20%. Um, and that's why, the, kind of a, by way of rationalisation, the domestic effort target itself has been, has been removed through the bill. Just briefly, what, I mean, what circumstances might this power be used that when you move, you don't revert to default position. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So, as I've said, the, this government's view is that it doesn't intend to use credits. So, in a sense, again, I'm, I'm necessarily speculating. The, in its advice on the bill, the UK Committee on Climate Change clearly advised that some limited flexibility to use credits be retained, and that the specific scenario that they uh, explored is... The, the possibility of kind of unforeseen changes in economic output year to year, and then kind of a need to counterbalance the, the industries coming from especially the in industrial sectors as that economic output changes. More widely, uh, as with a lot of things in the, the Act and the Bill, we're looking a very long way into the future, and there's a huge amount of just very broad uncertainty around international carbon trading, um, what will happen... Um, yeah, around kind of international coordination of these efforts, and, and it seemed to us prudent to retain 
retain some capability to come back to this without needing further primary legislation to do so. But the balance that's been struck is setting out very clearly a very, a very simple principle for the foreseeable future, which is no use of carbon units in, in, in any form. And in your view, will that uh, make targets, uh, these inventory revisions, make targets easier or harder to meet? And will the proposed changes help ensure greater objectivity, consistency and transparency? Um, I, I, sorry, can I take that, Tom? Um, uh, it will, not using international carbon credits makes the targets harder to use. And we haven't used international um, credits within Scotland previously, so that's not a comparison to the past within Scotland. It's a comparison to sort of a hypothetical um, possibility, um, potentially a comparison to other countries that do use um, credits. But yeah, all the effort having to be domestic is substantially tougher than it not all having to be domestic. I'm just saying, will it help objectivity and transparency? Will it become more clear to, to us all that this is... Uh, yes, a I think way it, of doing things. Yes, um, I, it's the, by having a default, um, the default scenario that zero credits are used. Um, that's I, th I think that's much easier to explain than every few years we'll consider whether we use credits or not. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Richard Lyle. Yes, thank you, convener. By virtue of section 16, 17, 18. The bill rationalises the annual report produced by under sections 34 and, uh, 33 and 34 of the 2009 Act. Can you tell the committee in what ways section 33 and 34 of the 2009 Act have been rationalised? What has been removed? What has been changed? And for what reason has this been done? That's a very big question to be brief on. Can you be brief, Callum? I can try to be brief, yes. If you just bear with me, I'll find the relevant sections of the, the Act. Um, the, the rationale for making changes here has come around through um, stakeholder requests to, to, to alter the way that we've, we've reported on the, the emissions in the past. At the moment, there's, there's been a convention that the Cabinet Secretary has made a statement in June following the publication of the greenhouse gas emission statistics. That's not a statutory requirement, but there is a requirement in the, the Act that a statement is made by the end of October. Um, and there's, there's a lot of crossover between the, the content of the June statement that follows the statistics and the statutory statement that's required in October under the Act. Um, and this was raised at conveners group in October last year, a proposal from WWF that the contents and the requirements for the October statement were moved wholesale to be applied um, following the, the publication of the statistics in June and that there'd be a statutory report and statement then and then following that later in the year there would be um, reports, more detail on progress that was being made in sectors later on. So the changes to sections 33 and section 34 have been done to allow that to happen. They're broadly similar in terms of what they do, but there are a couple of, of removals of elements that were, were contained in the reports in the Act. The, the first one that I'll go into is the a requirement to report against electricity related measures in section 34.4. Um, by removing that, we we're able to, to make the statement and produce the, the report earlier than we would have been otherwise. We discussed this approach with our technical discussion group that we set up to look at some of the technical elements of the bill. They were content with that proposal because these issues are reported on under the energy statistics and they'll be reported under the energy strategy as well on an annual basis. So it's not that they're being lost. They'll still be reported. They'll just be reported in another form. Tom's just talked about the 
removal of the domestic effort target and the reasoning behind that, that's also come out of the, the requirements to be reported on under section 33, although we've retained um, a requirement in the, the bill to report on the percentage of year-on-year -year reductions that are related to domestic effort should a future government choose to to move away from the default position that's been established under the the Act. The other there have been some other minor changes to the, the criteria to reflect the fact that we've moved from fixed amounts to percentage reductions um, under the new proposals in the bill. And I th think the Clarity on this. Um, clearly, I have a personal interest in this, having raised the issue at the conveners group. I think it's a terribly important matter. Um, to be clear, um, is where we're going to end up, courtesy of this bill, in a situation where potentially different ministers will give statements uh, indicating performance in their portfolios? So um, one of the, the WWF proposed that in the space created in October by the June statement being made statutory, they suggested that um, in that space, each relevant uh, minister or cabinet secretary make a statement to the full parliament about progress in their area. Um, we discussed that and considered that and thought it would be quite unwieldy. Um, we discussed it, um, I had several discussions with WWF myself about a potential different um, form um, whereby reports re are required to be laid in Parliament on progress in each sector, um, but not necessarily a statement by Scottish ministers. Of course, in legislation, you cannot specify, um, you cannot put any a requirement on any particular cabinet secretary or minister, the requirement has to be on Scottish ministers and then it's up to the first minister how that kind of gets gets divvied up, if you like. Um, so we you know, weren't able to specify that the reports have to come from different cabinet secretaries or have to be spoken to by different cabinet secretaries, um, but they do have to reflect different chapters in the climate change plan. So there will be a sort of suite of reports that are laid in Parliament and then it will be for, for Parliament and parliamentary committees to um, to consider how you want to make use of that and whether you want to call um, different people to, to discuss that with. Uh, but there's no requirement for actual statements to be made. In there's no requirement for actual statements to be made, that's correct. Okay, right, that's interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Hoyle. Uh, can we just move this on? Um, in terms of, of recommendations that came from Parliament about process, uh, there was considerable discussion around the period in which parliamentary committees have to uh, consider draft plans. There was unanimity around the fact that 60 days was completely inadequate. And I think, if I, if I recall correctly, there was some degree of, of discussion around what a better arrangement might look like. I think there was talk of 120 days, no limit, etc. We appear to have reached a point where what's in the bill is that we would that the period would be extended to 90 days, of which 60 days would cover the period when Parliament was sitting. Um, can you explain to me the rationale behind that position that's been arrived at? Callum can. Um, yeah, under the under the Act, the trigger for climate change plans is the making of an order to set an annual target. Um, and this, this must be done at least every five years at the moment. The bill proposals don't require the setting of annual targets in the same way because, as Tom's spoken about, they are calculated mechanistically in relation to the interim of the 2050 target. Um, that trigger will be lost, but it will be replaced with the requirement to lay a climate change plan at least every five years. So on that basis, we we looked at the responses to the consultation that, that we'd specifically asked questions on on what the the consideration period should look like. We took into account the views of the committees when we were discussing this with the technical discussion group again. And the position that we'd came to 
for the bill is that to ensure the Scottish ministers could meet that requirement in the bill to lay a plan within five years that, that the, there should be a defined period for the committee and the parliament to look against the plan, because if that wasn't there, then it might not be possible for, for Scottish ministers to meet the requirement in the bill to lay the plan within the five year period. And we got to the, the, the view and ministers' views that the extension of the, the current time period that Parliament's got to consider plans from the 60 days to the 90 days, including the 60 um, sitting days, is a good balance between the current arrangements and the calls for the consideration period to be open ended. Yeah, I, I suppose the only thing to say there is, of course, if we have recess periods in there, we could actually lose quite a lot of time and momentum around the scrutiny process. And I guess there's a, the other side to this, of course, is that as I, as I read this, there's no time limit for the government to produce its plan or to lay its draft plan or indeed to finalise its draft plan. And I recognise in the last instance, we did ask the government to take its time to finalise its draft plan. So I'm not being hypocritical there. Just want to be clear on, on, on the position. The, 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 there is a there is a time limit on when the final draft plan has to be laid. It has to be within five years of the previous draft plan. So that there there is a sort of defined period within it which it has to be done. But in terms of of the, 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 there's no requirement on when we get started. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. I, it just strikes me that, that 90 days is an improvement. I'm not convinced that where we've got to within that is, is exactly the best place. Um, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just confirmation under section 35B on page 17 at three, it, in relation to the report on the plan, it has to be laid by 31st of October. So presumably that interacts with um, laying the plan itself. Sorry, could, I'm sorry, can you I'm ask I'm on that page question? 17, if yep. that's helpful. Uh, yes, I've, I've got it. And I've got 35B3, 35B3, which is at line 18. Yes. Uh, I'm just making the point, a report, going back, Scottish ministers must in each relevant lay before Parliament a report on each substantial of the most recent climate change plan. Mm -hmm. So the plan which has been consulted by to varying lengths of time when the Parliament's sitting. Uh, nonetheless, to some extent, that need to report on the 31st of October. How does that interact with the 60 oblique 90 days? OK, I think I understand your question. Um, I may not understand your question. <laughs> um, I'm merely um, asking how they interact. OK, so the um, 35B refers to um, the, um, what we just spoke about, the, um, the progress reports against the plan. Yes. Um, so every, by each 31st of October, um, the relevant Scottish ministers will be required to um, report on progress to Parliament against the plan that is, that is the plan at that time. Um, so if there is a plan kind of in, in prep, that wouldn't be the one that would be reported against. It would be so, the sort of... So, sorry, do forgive me. Let me just intervene. So, there is no legislative interaction between the two. That's correct. Because the third of us October deals with a plan, whatever one happens to be prevailing. Yes. But in practical terms, is it in the minds of ministers that the 31st of October and the laying of a draft plan do interact in some way? And if that is in the ministers' minds, would it be appropriate for us to consider whether the um, bill as drafted should be tidied up to make it clear, clearer what that interaction is? So I can't comment on what's in the minister's mind. I can confirm that that hasn't been in, in our minds as officials. Well, so it's that, not that, a conversation that's fine. We've we'll had. move on. Can we? Yep. Let's wrap this up by looking at the finances uh, in relation to this. The financial memorandum, uh, I think, states that moving from an 80% to 90% greenhouse gas reduction target would have an estimated result in an annual system cost of approximately £13 billion over the period 2030 to 2050. And there are other accompanying figures. What I'd like to understand from you today is how robust the methodology is for calculating 
indirect costs? And what is the margin for error, error within that, sorry? Um, Cause it's not an exact science, you it's, can't it's, tell that. It's, it's certainly isn't, there's a great deal of uncertainty around the cost estimates given, they're really given as a best indication <laughs> um, rather than anything more. I think the only thing we can be absolutely certain of is that they will be wrong. <laughs> um, but um, really couldn't tell you in which direction or to... Or How good a guess is it? That's How good a guess question. is it is not something that I can answer. We haven't calculated. So the, the costs given in um, under the sort of times modelling section are quite evidently from times. Mm -hmm. um, and we, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, analysts have not... Um, attempted to sort of calculate confidence intervals around that. Um, and I don't know if it would be possible or a sensible thing to do, but I'm happy to take that away and look into it. On the sort of- But the in the absence of such detail, it looks like a figure, figure plucked out of thin air, which I know it's not, mm. but you know, is some of this detail available publicly? Can we see it? Um, the, I mean, the, from, in, I'm not sure I understand. Well, we've got a figure here of £13 billion as yeah. an estimated system cost over a 20-year period. Yeah. Um, what we're looking for is an understanding of how accurate that may be, how it was arrived at, and what confidence we can have in it. So can we say that the, the workings, as Mr Scott's whispering in my ear? OK. Potentially, we could show you the workings of times, but you really might be very sorry that you asked. Um, <laughs> OK, OK, let's, <laughs> let's break this down in another way, then. Um, presumably, we have an understanding. Uh, what were the things that were added together to get to £13 billion? Pounds, and what does that look, on a sec look like on a sectoral basis? Oh, well, we definitely can't answer the question about what it looks like on a sector basis. Um, my understanding uh, of times is, is limited, but what I, I do know is that um, it doesn't allocate... Um, costs to it only gives the overall system cost um any kind of ideas about where those costs will likely fall so, um depend on decisions taken by okay. ministers in climate so change so i'm getting plans. inundated with colleagues yeah, to ask a question and a little wonder subject. i mean a takeaway from this is please we, you need to come back to the committee yes. um with as much detail as, as can be provided on this because at the moment it looks you know pretty ropey to be honest um yeah mark ruskell first then john scott I find that answer quite staggering. Why, why produce a figure at all uh, if you can't justify it? I, I'm interested to know what all of the assumptions are um, behind that figure. So, for example, in terms of technology, does Times assume that £13 billion requires a degree of technology reinvestment as technology comes to an end and new technology is then invested in new capital plant or whatever? Um, you know, we need to understand whether these are additional costs to tackling climate change or whether these are actually costs that are inherent in moving an energy system towards 2050. Uh, so the, the, the kind of energy plant we would have had in 1986, okay, like so Longanit, for example, gets shut. Yeah, that's a system cost. Yeah. Would time see that as a massive, a massive cost to the okay, economy? OK, sorry, I've clearly done an exceptionally bad job in explaining where these numbers come from. It's true that they are indications. It's um, doing words in a committee session, but I think we well, need to understand exactly what the basis is before a, a figure like that is sort of thrown up as being, well, that's, that's the cost then. You know? OK, well, I can do a little bit better here verbally just now. Um, so um, the way in which we came up with that 13 billion cost was to run times for um, under the um, assumptions of the climate change plan to run that to 2050 for the 80 percent <coughs> um, end target the 80 percent target for 2050 um, we then ran it um, again um, the same but for a 90 percent target and took the system costs from both subtracted one from the other so the difference there is um, is 13 billion pounds so that's 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 above and beyond um, the cost that would just kind of happen anyway um, through, you know, society just continuing to, to function. I mean, is the additional cost of moving from an 80 to a 90% target? Is it reliant on purchasing credits? No. OK. Can I, can I ask you as well, um, did MD look at the figures about what it would cost if we didn't do it? 
Yes, so that's the cost of the, of, of the climate change plan. Right. Um, and that we gave you in the letter. So if we didn't increase the targets, mm -hmm. so we kept the targets at... Um, 80%. It's in the letter that we sent you. I'll try and find it. It is an addition. So the 13 billion is an additional. Mm -hmm. um, and the 80%. Oh, thank you very much, Callum. Is 2.2% of GDP. We. There was another. Yeah, we need to come back to you on that. Yeah, because, I mean, to have the overall picture here, yes, there may be an additional cost of yeah. some amount, uh -huh. but there's going to be an additional cost to the economy if we don't do this. Oh, so I understand what whole, you mean. Yeah. So the additional cost to the economy of not tackling climate yes. change. OK, so we attempted to set that out in the financial memorandum based on the work that was done for us by Climate Exchange. Um, and they looked at uh, the sort of global literature at the costs of mitigating climate change beyond um, two degrees to nearer 1.5 degrees, um, the cost of damages um, if we don't mitigate, the cost of mitigation and the cost of adaptation. Um, and they, so it's not possible, they weren't able to come up with costs for Scotland. Mm -hmm. They were able to um, review costs, average costs for countries um, and jurisdictions and I'm just looking for it now. Um, it's, a, it's a nicely titled Landscaping Review and Analysis of the Key International Assessments of the Economic Impacts of Climate Change Mitigation Policies. I'm surprised you haven't come across it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they set out um, the, the costs in terms of percentage GDP and the, I think the upshot was that the cost of the cost of not mitigating climate change is probably be more than the cost of mitigating climate That's change, um, but it is on the basis of probability um, because the, um, it depends so much, the estimates of cost depend so much on um, the likelihood of extreme events which become an um, issue of probability. So it sounds a pretty scary figure if it's accurate, but in reality it's not because we have to do it. It's a, it's a big, scary number, um, and not tackling climate change would be big and scary too. Yeah, that's the so, summary. Stuart Stevenson, Corey of you, Mr John Scott. Um, section 19 replaces Section 35 in the 2009 Act with the new Section 35. Um, subsection 4 is a word-for-word -word replication of Section 9 in 2009. Uh, 9 Act and subsection 5 of section, subsection 10, 2009 Act. Now, what do they say um, in relation to breakdown of costs? Uh, subse what the new subsection 4 says regarding respective contributions towards making emissions reductions that should be made by A, energy efficiency, B, energy generation, C, land use, C, D, transport. And that's word for word, folks, in 2009 and subsection five. The plan must also explain how the proposals and policies set out in the plan are expected to affect different sectors of the Scottish economy. You appear to have told us that we cannot do that. In other words, we can't break down the costs by, as it says in subsection five, previously subsection 10, affect different sections, sectors of the Scottish economy. Or have I misunderstood what I've been hearing? Um, yes and no. So what we can't do is separate out the costs up to 2050. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of difference in terms of what we can say about the plan and what we can say about targets up to 2050. Do forgive me just to intervene and uh -huh. bring it to a conclusion. So therefore, this really relates only to the plan. That's so it's essentially retrospective rather than prospective. Um, well, the plans look forward. Uh, yes, but it's reporting. So, so therefore, as far as the plan goes forward, uh -huh. in the first instance, we're looking at a plan that goes to 2032 at the uh -huh. moment. We should have the numbers under these separate headings rather than it being one aggregate number. Um, I'm going to. I don't have the plan to hand, so I can't answer it for myself. I'm sorry. I'm going to say you must be mistaken because we haven't done that, and we surely would have if we were required. I think I really need to take that one away. Yeah. 
much uh -huh. on that um, because there's going to be a lot of interest in this aspect I of it. Um, uh, Claudia Beamish and John Scott. I, I think I, I would like to just see what, what you come back with because mm -hmm. I have quite serious concerns about, um, about this, especially going between 2040 and 2050 if we can't look at the... If we don't know what the technology is going to be, I just don't understand how we can be um, putting figures into the air. Thank you. Um, and the clear interest is coming from a sector and business area where it's all very well to say it's just 13 billion, perhaps. Um, you know, different sectors would actually quite like to know what the real costs that they're likely to bear will be. I mean, our economy is reducing as we speak here in Scotland, and you're just saying, gaily, well, it might be 13 billion, perhaps, that that's going to cost businesses to carry on doing what they are doing and deliver better climate change. So I think a breakdown sector by sector would be enormously helpful uh, to give each sector, as mentioned by Stuart Stephen, some, some indication of the burden that's likely to be placed on them by this climate change proposal. We're, we're you simply, can't do that, you're not prepared to. We're simply not able to provide... Would that not be helpful? That. Would you not agree, or is it just tough? I, that... I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly not disagreeing that it, that it would be helpful to you if you're telling me that it would be helpful, but it's, it's not possible for us to provide that. With so how do you get the figure, necessary. Then? I think we do need to see those figures to determine whether the 13 big billion figure is believable, it's credible. There must be something that comes together, adds up to 13 billion. There has to be by definition. I will, we'll take this back to the analysts who run times um, to, to see what we can do. I'm, I'm really sorry if I've given the impression that I'm banding the number around gaily. It's certainly not my intention. No, 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 no not, not gaily, but without explanation. Well, with a clearly a very poor explanation, which I'll endeavour to correct. Right, I'm, I'm going to let Richard lie on because he's been waiting patiently. Oh, yeah. that, is that 13 billion based on today's prices or 13 billion based on 2050? Today's prices. So 13 billion in 2050 will be what? I can't tell you that. I don't it's, know. Uh, at least uh, 200 billion or more based on um, inflation, etc., for the next 30, 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you for that, Mr. So would it Lyle. be fair to say that this is a blank check that businesses across Scotland are being asked through the uh, enactment of this bill to sign up to a, as a, an unquantifiable cost and burden likely to be placed on them? Is mm. that a fair assessment of it? No, I don't think it is. No, I mean, wh where the cost. How would you define it then? Where the costs fall um, will depend on the decisions that future ministers make um, in the production of climate change plans, because it's in the climate change plans that we will establish, you know, how we will meet these targets, and that and that's where the sort of um, the impact on where the costs will fall can be considered, and we can't do that for the targets out to 2050. And, and to be accurate, it would have fallen the public sector as well, and it would fall on individuals. These costs, it wouldn't just be business. So, in theory, at least, the costs could fall to the public sector, to individuals and households, and or to businesses, to one of those entirely and not the others, or, or any yeah, kind of mix. it's a, a mix of the three. Yeah. Okay, um, we're going to draw this to a conclusion. I think we've covered a lot of ground, particular interest in this last section. Understood. There's a number of things that you've agreed to come back to, so uh -huh. we look forward to that. As much detail as possible in this particular element, the financial element, would be not only helpful but necessary, frankly. Uh, can I thank you for your time? And I'm going to suspend for five minutes. Thank you.
So, uh, welcome back uh, to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, the third item on the agenda is to hear evidence on Scotland's biodiversity targets. We're joined by Bridget Campbell, Director of Environment and Forestry, and Sally Thomas from SNEH. Uh, welcome both. And in case you weren't here at the start, just to, to make you aware, there's a minute's silence at 12 noon. We'll suspend to respect the minute's silence. So, uh, thank you for that. So let's uh, start. Um, I want to ask a question about the international context to uh, progress on achieving biodiversity targets. I don't ask that question to perhaps provide any wriggle room for Scotland, but just to get uh, a context here. How are we performing set against the, the rest of the globe? So I could start on that, convener. Um, I mean, the big thing that's happening internationally at the moment is actually looking forward. So that's thinking about the, uh, the next Biodiversity Convention Conference of the Parties happening in Beijing in 2020 and setting even stronger targets, probably. But as against the, at the international level, the most recent overview report that published in 2014 gave a global progress report against the targets. And to be honest, that showed a very mixed picture across the whole world. And I think if I was going to summarise, I would say Scotland is further ahead on a few more targets than the global overview, so the sort of global average. For example, Scotland is really ahead in terms of reporting. Um, we're the, the only country which has produced a full report on HE. However, that doesn't make us at all complacent. So I you know, very much take what you said at the beginning. It's, um, everyone is struggling with this. And just to give a little bit more context, um, I recently attended a meeting of officials that deal with nature and biodiversity across the EU. Um, and I specifically went there really to get the answer to the question that you're asking, because I just didn't have a good sense of it. And it was clear that the challenges that we're working on in Scotland are similar to those that are being faced in every other EU country at any rate. And the main theme underlying that meeting really was the challenge that all countries are facing in raising public awareness of the issue. And no country really seemed to have completely succeeded in convincing the public in general of the importance of biodiversity and the impact of its loss. I mean, we've just been listening to the climate change session and it's quite a different state of consciousness on that, I would say. Yeah. So I think that is really, for me, that's the central theme that all countries are struggling with. And the two things are related. Climate yeah. change feeds into yeah. loss of biodiversity. Yes. I guess the question that flows from that is, do governments take this seriously enough? Well, um, yes, but I think the big thing that comes out of the report that we was published earlier this year of progress against the HE targets, which shows quite, you know, quite mixed progress, even for Scotland, um, I think the answer is that we need to take it more seriously. And you know, I think the reaction that we had um, in, 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 within the Scottish Government and with all the public bodies that we deal with who have responsibilities in this area was actually to try and do a bit more about it. So do, shall I, maybe Sally could say a bit more about that. In terms of what we're going to be doing yeah. next, yes. Yeah, because we, we, we actually did look, and we had a, we had a meeting um, at the end of last year um, with all the public bodies, um, in, in relevant public bodies, and immediately relevant, because of course, it, there, I know there is a biodiversity duty reporting for everyone, but lots of public bodies, but the most local ones, the most relevant ones, SEPA, SNH, bodies like that. And what we looked at was each of the areas where we're not doing as well as we're meant to be doing against the HE projections. And we came up with some specific things we need to do. So I think we are we are really seized of the fact that this needs more effort. Okay, I know Finlay Carson yeah. wants to come on a point on, on yeah. this. Uh, but do you want to ask a question here about who takes the lead? Yeah, absolutely. What's, what's not clear is that the Scottish Government or SNH that's actually taking uh, lead responsibility for in implementing the well, biodiversity. It, it's ultimately, of course, it's the responsibility of Scottish ministers and therefore the Scottish Government to deliver the biodiversity strategy and to. Um, account for it to the Scottish Parliament here. Um, SNH is accountable to Scottish ministers and NDPB. It's the government's, obviously, the government's statutory nature conservation advisor and biodiversity is at the core of much of what it does. So what the government has asked it to do is a kind of 
uh, a piece of work, really, which is to lead and coordinate across all the partners in the public, private and third sector on the delivery of the strategy, the 2020 strategy and the route map. Um, they were really closely involved in the preparation of the strategy and the route map. And they're now leading groups which are coordinating delivery. And they, they do the progress reports on the route map. They do the statutory three-year report and the report on meeting HE. Um, but that is at the request of ministers. I mean, there's no doubt that ministers understand that this is, this is the Scottish government's responsibility. So just on the back of that, you know, yeah. it could be argued that the, the, the strategy is, and, and you, you, you commented on uh, the, the additional uh, indicators and reporting and the improvements yeah, in that, yeah. but would that not suggest that the, the strategy is maybe too focused on a process and not actually focused on where it ne the action needs to be taken to deliver well, better outcomes? I think it does need to have both elements in it. I mean... Of course, it would be better if we were doing brilliantly across all the different, sec you know, different components. And it's true that we're doing better on the more mechanical things, uh, or in some cases, anyway, not completely. But I think that the strategy does have in it lots and lots of ambition, high-level commitments, about real progress on di biodiversity. And the route map is essentially a programme of practical projects that deliver real improvement in biodiversity. I mean, they're really good examples, for example, in peatland, but others too. Sally, do you want yeah, to say about just, that? just come in there, convener. I mean, I would agree. It's, it's very important that we do have um, process and governance underpinning what we do. Um, and SNH has um, uh, a comprehensive um, series of monitoring and indicators, and we have a range of governance groups which are working with um, a number of partners across the public sector and, and the NGO community. Um, and that's all kind of good and proper, and we need to be able to do that, and we have reporting requirements, and we have to feed in at the UK level and so forth. But it's really important, and I think we, none of us would underestimate that actually what we're really trying to do is make progress on the ground, and that's, that's really where, where our ultimate goal is. And, and, and some, of the, you know, some of the excellent examples of work on the ground, for example, I mean, just yesterday... Um, we launched the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative. Um, that's a community-based um, project around about uh, 29,000 square kilometres, looking at engaging communities in terms of um, riparian um, uh, invasives. Really high priority, an area where we recognise there's more work to be done. So there is a lot of practical work going on on the ground. Um, that's a joint HLF SNH funded project. We also have Peatland Action, where we SNH you know, receive money from government. We have over 10,000 hectares of peatland restored, further commitment to further 8,000 hectares. These are all really important work on, on the ground, which we need to report on, obviously, and we need to be able to show what we've done and how we've spent the money. But there is a lot of good work going on uh, across Scotland. Isn't one of the criticisms that's made and a legitimate criticism that we pat ourselves on the back for getting more people out enjoying nature, when in actual fact what matters is in ensuring that we have the species for future generations to enjoy. Aren't we doing the easy stuff, but the really difficult stuff we're struggling with? It, it's a balance. Yeah. It, it's a balance. And the more that people um, appreciate and enjoy nature, the more that kind of societal change, which we've seen across the climate change agenda, is likely to come into play. There is a lot of uh, time and effort going into individual species projects. For example, Scottish Wildcat Project. I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of you saw the wonderful photographs yesterday released from Edinburgh Zoo um, of the, the, the wildcat kittens, which are taking their kind of first steps into the outside world. Those sorts of projects, which are um, uh, resource intensive, but absolutely important to, um, to help us to um, bolster populations of uh, rare or endangered species across Scotland. OK, right. OK, thank you. Let's move this on. Mark Roscoe. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to focus uh, in on some of the, the particular problems um, that we have around uh, a number of the targets. Um, I mean, you'll be aware of the, you know, the headline here. There's only there's only seven targets that are that are on track out of twenty. Um, so perhaps if we could just drill down a bit into these. Um, 
I mean, B5 is about habitat loss. So perhaps could we start there? What, what's the gap? What, what needs to happen, uh, particularly in terms of land use management, to turn that particular target around? Okay, so habitat loss um, is a particularly complex issue, as I'm sure you'll appreciate. Um, it's not related just to the target, it's not related just to counting up the number of hectares of habitat have been lost. There's obviously the, the relative proportion of um, habitat which has been restored um, or indeed created as well. We have a, a, a range of um, restoration works underway which contribute to this target. Um, we have a lot of work underway to try and more accurately map and assess different habitats and the extent to which they are declining or increasing. But I think it's fair to say it's not, it's not without challenges. Um, and we recognise those and through the route map, um, we certainly recognise woodland restoration and expansion as being an area where there are challenges for us. Um, certainly in terms of the native woodland target, that's why increased planting um, grants for planting rates have been put in place through FCS to increase the amount of incentive for, um, for landowners to, to help them with, um, you know, um, woodland planting, which will, you know, help us with those targets. Um, there are a number of habitats which are showing decrease uh, in terms of their condition, not just, not the extent, but the in condition. Woodland, again, is another one where, um, while the extent of some, some woodland areas might be maintained, it's actually the condition of that habitat which is at issue. So again, slightly different range of issues which we need to tackle. Um, there have been some real successes though as well. Um, out in, the fresh water, in the freshwater environment, the Pearls in Peril project, we've restored um, freshwater function across 19 rivers in Scotland. And it's those sorts of specific projects which can do a lot to help us with that habitat restoration target. But, but we're, not, we're not meeting it. So clearly we need a step change. You didn't mention agriculture. What, what work is being done to consider using a future agricultural subsidy system to reverse some of the catastrophic habitat loss that we've seen since the Second World War? Well, well we are starting to think about that. Um, the, the agriculture um, champions working for Mr Ewing um, put out their final report recently, and one of the things they acknowledge in that is that there is a real need to think about how the how the how any future funding can contribute to these outcomes that we, we want. So but we're just at the footholds of doing that really. I think it's just thinking that's beginning to start starting what, now. What, when what, when do you think there'll be an outcome to that thinking process? Well I think um, Mr Ewing has said that he will um, respond with the sort of government's position later in the year to the agriculture champions. So they've kind of set, a, I think, quite a good framework of issues that need to be addressed. And then, So later in the year, the government should come up with some response to that. OK. If I could turn to um, target B9. So this is control of invasive species. I think you've, you've already uh, touched on that, Sally Thomas. But, I mean, is there a disconnect here with the scale of the problem? Because my understanding is that, you know, we've got challenge funding now, uh, one year funding going into to supporting the work. Um, but there's about two million pounds being put into control, for example, of rhododendron, and yet the potential demand to tackle this problem would be nearer mm -hmm. 400 million pounds. So uh, are we actually running to stand still here? Uh, and, and to what sense is there that we, we can actually get a, a grip of some of the long-standing invasive species problems over the next five to ten years before they, they become very, very costly problems. I think, um, I think you make a very good point there, is getting a grip on these problems before they become uh, a huge financial burden. And certainly we recognise that um, early identification and rapid response is perhaps one of the most important things that we need to do. We're developing new information systems which will help us then to, to underpin and to inform that rapid response so we can um, identify and deal with um, invasive species before they become that larger and more resource intensive um, problem. So for example, there's a, a new plant tracker app which provides for a rapid notification um, across um, Great Britain, which means that then those high alert species, um, ones which we know are on the boundaries trying to come in, I suppose, or particularly um, invasives, that we can have that very rapid identification and alert 
and work um, across the country to take action before they, they take hold. Are those action plans actually happening at a catchment level? Because I know, for example, on the Allen Water catchment, uh, you know, the local fisheries trust there has been doing a lot of work, but there hasn't been money for coordination. And they've been getting, you know, a little bit of cash from the local Tesco supermarket to do this work. I mean, that doesn't seem to really be addressing the need for catchment-wide action. So I understand what you're saying about apps and reporting mm -hmm. and all of that. What, what happens then? And, and you know, what, what, are the, what are the targets, if you like, the interim targets to actually tackle these problems of, of invasive species? So I haven't got the detail of catchment where we're taking catchment scale approaches, so I'd be very happy to provide some more information on that. And I think CEPA will be um, very much to the fore in that, um, in that work, so we can get some further information from them if that would be helpful. OK, the, la the last um, uh, point that I've got is around um, the target C12, and this is preventing species extinction. Uh, uh, and we've seen some horrific figures coming forward, particularly in relation to seabirds, particularly in relation to climate change, overfishing a whole range of different pressures, and indeed other species as well, waders, upland birds, species, butterflies. Is it, it, it what, what, what should government be doing to make a step change in these areas? Is it, can we bring some of these species back from the brink? There's, there have been no recorded extinctions in Scotland, um, but we do recognise that some of our species are under threat, um, and there is targeted action for specific species, and I've, I've already mentioned wildcat, uh, red squirrel is another, and, and a range of birds species. We're also developing a, a priority species indicator so that we can get a better handle on all of this. Um, I think we need to um, we need to work with different species in different ways. That's that's really um, what the you know what the bottom line is because what's needed for one species will not necessarily work for another. Um, I think we also need to um, understand that for some species, the action we put in place now can take some time to work through at a population level. So um, we shouldn't always be expecting to see very swift results. And I think probably the, the, the wildcat um, example is a good one of that. We have action un underway, very focused, very targeted, um, a, a lot of uh, interest and a lot of volunteers involved in that. But it is a long-term project, and it will take a number of years to come to fruition. Um, some, some of those actions are in relation to the management of the land, and that, take, again, we have to work with individual land managers very often to, um, to look at how we can work through different types of land management that might favour particular species, whether it might be butterflies or other invertebrates, for example. So it's a, it's a mixed picture, but we are, um, we are developing a priority species indicator, and we will use that to be able to prioritise which species need targeted action. The species that are dependent, absolutely dependent on land management in order to bring them back from uh, the brink of extinction, mm. uh, is the voluntary approach to that working? So we have a lot of good work underway through the, um, through the EEC scheme, through in the incentives scheme already. Um, we have advisors who work directly with land managers out on their, their holdings to, um, to identify where specific bits of, of habitat or connectivity or ecological coherence can benefit the specific species they have on their land. Um, I'm not sure how we would take... A, a, how do you mean a voluntary approach? I mean... Well, pres in presumably terms of you're, you're reliant on land managers coming forward to self-identify that they're interested in protecting a certain species or whatever. For those that aren't interested, well, what's the compulsion for them to do anything? So I, I, I don't know what, what kind of percentage that, of land yeah, managers see, are actually yeah, coming yeah, forward. Yeah, I see where you know? you're going. I, yeah, absolutely. I suppose the flip side to that is um, in relation to targeted and focused projects that SNH or the NGOs might develop in partnership, um, either for a particular species or within a particular locality. Um, and that's, that's targeted action for a species. Um, and if some of the land managers in that locality choose not to come on board, 
there is still a project running which will work and help to persuade, we hope, the majority in a locality to do that. Do you to that? How, how you kind of get on top of best practice and share it. I mean, I've seen terrific examples myself of, of the Forestry Commission on wildcats in Glen Iowa, um, the Game and Wildlife Conservation uh, Farm that they're operating in D side and protecting waders. Both of these are very good projects. How do you kind of pull that knowledge together and encourage others to roll out this kind of practice? So SNH runs a series of sharing good practice events, um, and they are, the name's kind of on the tin, they are aimed very much at sharing the good practice and experience of practitioners throughout Scotland. We, we use those um, extensively for a whole range of different topics. We also work um, and encourage others such as um, Royal Highland Education Trust or the Soil Association who do a lot of on-farm um, work with land managers where they will um, use kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, you know, um, work so that farmers are talking to other farmers or land managers or foresters about the work that they are doing on their farms um, within local areas. So there is a lot, there's a lot of work going on out there which we are, as SNH, are either directly involved in or, or help to support. Up Mark Ruskell's point about seabirds and particularly the horrifying numbers that are um, coming forward about I think the birds in the Orkneys, there's some significant mm -hmm. problems there. Now, the, there's global factors at play here. Climate change is clearly an impact. Mm -hmm. So, what dialogue is SNH or the Scottish Government having with international partners to see what research they've done, what thoughts they have on how we address this? Mm -hmm. So, we, we would work across um, the, the global community in terms of um, the academic community, so we, we can better understand what's happening to these species when they are out with Scottish waters. Difficulty being you know, that many, many seabirds particularly come to Scotland for only part of the year, and they move their wintering grounds or their feeding, primary feeding grounds are out with Scottish waters. So it's very important that we have that dialogue, we seek to understand, and then there's still a lot of learning and understanding required for some of these species. Um, in terms of their life cycles and where they go to, to either to, to, to feed or to, to overwinter. So we certainly have those dialogues ongoing. Um, I think it also plays into what Bridget was saying earlier about the, you know, the, these, are, these are global targets we're talking about and there's a, there's a need for us to be at the global table, really, um, and participating in those discussions either as, as part of the UK um, administrative body that undertakes that or uh, in a Scottish context. So, again, those conversations are really important. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish and then Stuart Thank Stevenson. Convener, good, good morning to you both. Um, we've, um, our convener's touched on um, seabirds um, and the importance of those concerns. Could I ask you specifically about um, the marine environment and our coastal um, areas? Um, and, of course, we do have some MPAs have been um, uh, announced and are, are active and being monitored. Uh, could I ask what, if there's assessment of the impact of um, MPAs um, firstly? And then I've got another brief uh, follow-up question. So do you mean impact upon... Impact in? on, um, on our target um, B6 for... Oh, OK. Um, sustainable management of the marine environment. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. Yeah, so, I mean, you're right, there's been really considerable progress made in terms of the MPA network, um, uh, and that's coupled with um, progress on harvesting at sustainable levels, and um, for a number of key fish species as well, there's, there's you know, for example, implementation of an end to discards and all, a whole range of activity leading to healthier fish stocks. I have to say, I'm not quite clear why the target is, uh, is showing insufficient progress, given the, the progress we have made with the MPA network. Um, it may be that it's a timing issue, and the report was timed um, you know, for, the, for the situation at the end of 2017, and we've made further progress. So I think on that one, if, it, if, um, if you're content, I think we need to seek some further advice from uh, Marine Scotland on that. Yes, that, that would be helpful, and what would be helpful as well mm. is we, we've, you've highlighted the, 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 the ways in which um, the approach has changed because of the MPAs, but what would be useful is to know um, if there have been any assessment of the specific impacts um, as to whether there's, in, within those areas, whether things are improving or not. 
um, if it's possible, and also um, the, the wider issue around was the second part of my, my um, exploration with you of, of the marine environment, the wider issue around um, further action that's being taken out with the MPAs uh, at present and whether those are, to, are focusing on um, ecological coherence and networks. Okay, there's, I mean, there is a lot of work um, across the whole of Sc Scotland's marine environment, um, um, certainly the development of the National Marine Plan, um, aquaculture, seaweed harvesting, fishery strategies. Um, all of these are helping to focus efforts on sustainable marine management. Um, the, in terms of the, action, the, the more specific action, I would say on the ground, in the water, um, on the MPAs, again, we can seek some further advice from Marine Scotland on that. And, and on the broader and issues, the, please. Uh, broader, yeah. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just back to invasive species. Um, clearly, with invasive species such as rabbits and hares that the Romans brought, now regarded as native species, American crayfish, a huge problem, and most recently, beavers, who were... Uh, almost certainly uh, released illegally uh, and deliberately uh, in Tayside, which are now making the transition to being uh, regarded as a native species. What's the overall policy in determining how we make that transition from something being an invasive species to being regarded as a protected or quasi-native species? an incredibly good philosophical question, ah, well, it, it, <laughs> to if, which I'm sorry, I don't Sorry, mean, sorry. Yeah. If I may just intervene, yeah. I recognise there's a philosophical element to it, but yeah. there is a genuine and real impact on that probably illegal action in Dayside yes. that we cannot afford to disregard because of the what that message in relation to that policy issue might send to people who might start releasing yeah. wolves or lynxes or a whole variety of other things yeah. which would cause me and I suspect others considerable concern. Well, so we have been working with the Scottish Beaver Forum, um, certainly in terms of the licensing arrangements to um, provide at guidance and advice to land managers on um, those who are experiencing problems with beavers. Sorry, can Is I intervene? Where you're I'm, heading? I'm, not, no. I'm not trying to explore the detail no, okay. of the beaver issue. There's another time and place. But the overall approach, is there a consistent approach to how we regard that transition from you know, we would eliminate every American crayfish yeah. in our rivers yeah. and lochs if we could. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to suspend right now and we'll come back to answer that with a moment of silence. Moving the discussion up a level to the more general. That's just to, be, to clarify, we have, um, we have the Scottish Code on reintroductions and translocations of species, and certainly any, any legitimate proposals that come forward as opposed to illegal releases would be um, evaluated in, in terms of the, the, the process and the considerations under that code. So we have a, we have a process in place for um, you know, any proposals that, that come forward. Um, illegal releases are, by definition, illegal, um, 
And that's, that's a very different matter, and I think we would need to consider all of those on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and just to go back to your kind of very deep philosophical point, I think that what we regard as illegal and not illegal is reflecting you know, cultural views in this country. And going back to the meeting I mentioned earlier, it was very interesting. So, well, yes, and, and it was very interesting to hear from other countries like um, Croatia or Bulgaria, who were talking about, you know, they already, well, in, in, in Bulgaria, they have the bear and the wolf. And in Croatia, they have the bear, the wolf, and the lynx. And the, they have got to the point where, well, they are at a point in their culture where actually the main issue is not about species, it's just about how do we pay people for the damage that these animals do, you know? So it's a very different place. That uh, just to close it off, because yeah. we have other things yeah. to cover. Yeah. We are quite clear that uh, while Evidentially, I know the fiscal could not get the necessary corroboration to prosecute those responsible for the beaver release. Nonetheless, it was prima facie not permitted under the law, almost certainly prohibited under the law, because there were, there were beavers originally held uh, under license in a constrained area from which they were released. Yeah, I think that's my understanding. I think that's right, so. Sally. Yes. 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 Thank you, yeah. convener. Um, Bridget Campbell, I think earlier on, at the, the outset of this, you, you made reference to the previous discussion about climate change. I, and the fact is that the public get climate change. They buy into tackling climate change. And we achieve our targets. What do we need to do to mainstream biodiversity values in the same way and get that public buy-in? And, and sitting alongside that, what specific action does the Scottish Government and SNH have in mind to address failing to hit the targets? Well, on the second part of that, um, Sally, in answer to some questions earlier from Mr Ruskell about specific areas where we're failing, she gave some examples of where action has been upped because it's been clear that if we carry on the way we are, we won't meet the target. And I think another example of that, I think you did refer to this, but a really good one that I'm aware of recently is that um, it was noticed that in particular part of Scotland in the Highlands, um, we weren't, you know, that native woodland was not flourishing. So the Forestry Commission adjusted their grant rate and that led to more native woodland trees being planted. So I think there are some quite specific things that we can do. And one of the things that we're doing through the Environment and Economy Leaders Group, which is the group that brings together all the chief executives of the, the main bodies that are relevant to this. Um, we've been looking together at where we're failing, you know, where the targets are failing, to think of specific things. That's just one example. But I think we need quite a kind of programme approach to this to actually pin down, well, in a specific case, what could we do differently and what could one of these partners do differently? Um, now, uh, 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 there, is, there is, in fact, um, coincidentally, a meeting going on in Aviemore today of, of this group. And one of the things that they are looking at on the agenda is how we can do more to um, get back on track with the HE targets that we're not on track for. And I think that I mean, SNH has been asked by the Cabinet Secretary to really look at this and how they can coordinate all of these actions. And that's work in progress, but in due course, once that has come to the Minister, I'm sure she'll be letting you know about it, because we're very conscious that we've got to do something to change all this. Um, I think that it may be something like Blue Planet. Um, I heard, um, I, I hear that Actually, Sir David Attenborough is apparently planning to make a film um, or a series of films um, to go on Netflix that are being pushed by WWF. And it's on biodiversity specifically. Of course, the, the stuff Blue Planet is about biodiversity too. But I think there is a, there's a whole issue about just um, gaining understanding and sharing understanding about the value of biodiversity and the impact of its loss, which just hasn't reached that tipping point. And we can all play a part in a smaller way. You know, I'm sure that some of the things that the chief executives are discussing are how we can do more on public information, do more on you know, campaigns and so on. 
but I think it may be one of those things where a tipping point suddenly happens. And it, well, I really hope it does. But I think that's what needs to happen. It has to be a point where people, not just specialists and experts, appreciate why insects matter. You know, it, uh, to go back to the, by the nature directors meeting again, there was a really interesting presentation from Germany, but the Germans seemed to assume that everyone thought insects were good. You know, whereas actually most people don't have, don't know much about most insects and would only mention perhaps bumblebees or ladybirds, but not all the insects that are relevant. And I guess it's just dawned on me, yeah. I should have declared their interest at the start of this. In fact, I think every member of the committee might have declared their interest because I think we're all species champions, uh, with the exception of Mr Stevenson. Well, he is as well, right, OK. Um, and that, there's, there's a relevance to that because there's a role for parliamentarians um, to, to, to champion the cause and raise uh, public awareness of these important issues. Um, as I say, I, I do declare an interest there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm um, the species champion for the narrow-headed ant. Right. Uh, and I was up and yeah. looking at some at the weekend, up, up probably your neck of the woods. Um, but what is, what is the, um, the education programme and where's the links with, with schools around biodiversity? Because that One would be key, would it not, to, sorry. To, um, to engage in? Because I, I find that even if you look at things like recycling. I know in Fife that I always put a lot of credit on the fact that, that we started to have all these eco-schools and suddenly yeah. children were talking to their parents about the importance of recycling. Uh, yes, and it is one of the issues that is being discussed today by the Chief Executives is, is what initiative could be taken on education. Um, I'm just trying to quickly find the exact description of what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the case uh, from the work that we do with SNH that um, if you can if you can influence um, young people, they will go home and seek to influence their parents and their siblings. We um, we do a lot of work with um, learning in outdoor learning in nature. Um, we're working with um, schools across Scotland to both um, identify how learning can use, uh, the, the curriculum can use nature as a means to, you know, deliver those aspects of, of the curriculum, whether it be, you know, maths or, or science or whatever, um, but also to ensure um, that um, schools have access to good quality green space that they can use as part of the, the school day. Um, we have a commitment to um, 100 schools in Scotland's most disadvantaged communities having easy access to green space. Um, we're working through that commitment at the moment with, with local authorities and other partners to ensure that, the, 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 um, you know, that interaction with nature is something which uh, our young people don't, don't just read about or learn about, but they actually get out and, and experience it. Uh, and if their families are not perhaps able to, to help them have that experience, they're able to do that as part of their their, their formal education. And I think all, all the bodies that I mentioned, like SNH and SEPA, but also the national parks have a part to play in this. I mean, for example, I know that the Cairngorms National Park, just to take them as an example, uh, have been holding something called the Big Weekend, which is all about getting lots and lots of local people and beyond Cairngorms out into nature. So. I mean, there's a whole load of different things that need to happen. Um, so I'm sort of violently agreeing with what you were suggesting, I think. A number of members want to come in here. I do hope it's not to plug their own species. Uh, Mark <laughs> Ruskell followed by Finlay Carson. You may be disappointed, Kavina, but um, I, 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 there is an issue here about public confidence, though, particularly in, in the agencies. And I hope hopefully that's something that's being discussed today because you know, I'm species champion for the sea eagle. There's been a number of illegal disappearances um, in, in, in Scotland. I think we all know that this is probably linked to wildlife crime. I think the evidence points in that direction. And yet, when SNH then takes a decision to issue, an, issue a cull for a raven, uh, sorry, a license for a raven cull in an area where there's been a number of disappearances of raptors over the years, that has generated an enormous amount of public concern. 
the public wants to know the basis for that, the rationale for that decision. There are concerns that those who may or may not have been involved in the disappearance of the raptors are also involved in uh, this license regime and this trial project. So uh, my inbox has been uh, overflowing with concern around that, and, it, and it's really touched a nerve with many people. So I don't know how, how agencies can really maintain that public confidence when you've got these big issues, and wildlife crime is one of them, uh, which really resonate in people's minds and really, really become a, a central issue for, for how people define whether Scotland is actually protecting its biodiversity or not. Certainly on, on wildlife crime, I don't think anyone in this room would, would, would you know, do anything other than absolutely abhor wildlife crime that unfortunately still exists in some parts of the country. Um, SNH works very closely with uh, Police Scotland, um, with the Partnership for Action on Wildlife Crime, um, to, to do everything we can, both in terms of bringing um, any of those perpetrators to justice and also to, to seek to you know, educate those who might have different views about that. Um, I don't want to go into the detail of specific cases. Um, I think that's probably, you know, there's been a lot said and, and I think there's a lot on, on the public record about that. Um, what I would say though, I suppose, is that um, certainly SNH feels that there is a conversation we need to have about wildlife management in Scotland um, and that there are some big questions that we need to perhaps unpack collectively about uh, our environment, our species, and how we can coexist within um, you know, the landmass of Scotland. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, Carson. Do, do you think we're getting the balance right? I'm, I'm concerned that uh, we spend all our time getting the public on board and actually while that's happening, we're losing species that might not be the sexy species of the month. So, you know, we're missing, well, there's no progress in 11 targets and five that are getting worse. Well, maybe public awareness of the sea eagle might be improving or the, the Lesler bat, as I'm the champion of, but has, has the balance shifted from actually protecting biodiversity to almost justifying that there's expenditure on it? I'm concerned that while we get the public on board and we open up green spaces around cities and things, that actually some dung beetle in Sutherland is going to become extinct because the government are finding it difficult to justify the, the, the expenditure that's required to protect that. Are, are we getting the balance right? Well, we think it's the right balance. Although, yes, I mean that, we, we're trying to strike a balance between all the awareness raising things that we've been talking about and sort of education and cultural change and actually doing real things with species that are at risk. And Sally described earlier some quite sophisticated ways of making sure that we're alerted to those things and are able to take action. Um, we also work very closely with some of the um, very specialist um, uh, interest groups and NGOs who, who um, will alert us and do alert us when there are issues with some of those perhaps Less, lesser known species, um, you know, the, the, the small and the perhaps, you know, ones that we don't necessarily see day by day. So um, that is, they are involved through our contacts through, contacts through Scottish Environment Link. Many of them are involved through the, the working groups for the um, biodiversity strategy. Um, and um, many of the specialist societies um, it's just about butterflies uh, or, or other, you know, spe particular groups of species work with us on a, on a, you know, on a routine basis. So we have our ant antennae out to, to to work with them, and we we think we we have the balance right, um, and hopefully you do as well. Still got a lot of ground to cover, uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah, let's uh, talk to the. <clears throat> the real world, the real world is the national funds for tackling biodiversity uh, uh, loss and conservation. Um, I note that the Scottish Environment Funders Network report says that Scotland is at a considerable disadvantage compared to the rest of the UK in terms of attracting funding for conservation projects from 2012 to 15. Private foundation funding for environmental causes in England and Wales amounted to 20 times as much as available in Scotland, and that's equivalent to £768 per square kilometre in England and Wales versus 
per square kilometer in Scotland. So, in regard to uh, previous answers, we targets to what extent are targets reliant on increasing financial <laughs> resources, and has there been an impact of decline in public funding and current staff capacity within the Scottish Government and SNH for bio diversity? Um, well, you covered a great deal of ground in, in that. <coughs> um, I think, right, well, well to, go, to go to the end of the question first, um, I think it's quite difficult to actually be clear about exactly how much public funding is spent on biodiversity. We haven't really disaggregated that, and SNH is doing some work at the moment to try and get a better indicator, because that was the HE target which we were going away from. So money being spent on it, I think we, we're not clear enough, even about how much public money you know, within the public sector, which we ought to be able to account. Well, well, I was going to say, come on, and then you've just revealed, as you said, in that, that um, I think it was called, Where Do the Green Grants Grow, that report. Um, it, so that's telling us something that we probably need to do something about. Um, I think that in terms of the money that goes to SNH, um, which is one of the main champions of all of this, well, the main bodies working in it in Scotland, um, you know, we, we, SNH had a good grant, I think a what they would regard as a positive settlement in the, the, the current year. Um, in the Scottish Government, we, you know, there have been a number of changes, but we are actively recruiting new people and to increase the resource on this. Um, but coming back to the private sector money, um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, well, it is a challenge to, real, you know, to have that pointed out. We need to think, is there anything we and the government could actually do about it? At the moment, I would say the two main areas um, where I think there is action already going on is that SNH is working with the Heritage Lottery Fund um, to try and get a more strategic approach to getting priority for environmental projects through the funding that they give, which is, I think that's quite a good source. And the other thing I'd mention is that both SNH and the Scottish Government um, have some pretty good links with businesses through the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital, so that might be a place we could take these questions. Um, yes, the, the, the work with HLF has been um, uh, extremely positive, actually. Um, it's it's partly about prior, prioritising what, what bids might be coming forward. Um, through HLF year on year so that we're not wasting what resources we have in bidding against each other, but also trying to increase you know, the environmental um, awareness of, uh, within HLF and the importance. And that's certainly that approach we can then um, seek to, to, to work with other major funders, some of the ones you know, those identified in, in that report that you mentioned. I think it's also um, uh, it's, it's, it's important, I suppose, to recognise that um, success isn't always... Uh, just a reflection of the amount of money that is, is spent. Um, and certainly some of the work that we've done, it, it, it's, it's clear that it's quite possible to do more for biodiversity, certainly in a local context, with, um, with even with a reduced resource. And the, the sorts of examples might be changing of mowing regimes in local authorities, um, changing the composition of... Um, the, um, the planting that's used, again, whether that be through, through the public sector or through local authorities. So, for example, rather than planting bedding plants, you could plant planting um, uh, pollinator um, attractive species or different types of species rich planting. These, are, these seem quite small scale, but they, they add up and they don't necessarily cost um, additional resource. It's a, it's, it for many, it's actually a different way of thinking about the same problem. Right, can I ask you, and, and this is one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm interested in, what can the Scottish Government do to improve links with private funders of, of environmental work in Scotland? And if there is Scottish Government funding provided, should it be given on a three to five year budget process rather than yearly in order to ensure that there is long term stability both for staff and agencies that are working on projects um, which we feel are, are worthwhile. Yeah, just... to that. It, it, do you think there's a role for environmental NGOs in attracting um, non-governmental funding? Because one would imagine they have a message to, 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 to send out to possible uh, funders. And I just wonder if, if you see 
a job for them here in trying to attract that type of finance? Oh, I think absolutely. A, a number of the major um, conservation-based projects that we have in Scotland are um, the, the lead partner mm. will be one of the NGOs. Yeah. And they are often um, best placed to play that role. I mean, we certainly wouldn't think that the, the public sector or, or SNH needs to be in, in the lead. We will be very happy to be a partner, but it, it certainly often makes sense and often makes sense for um, financial and tax reasons, I understand, that that um, the NGO, if they're a charity, is actually the body that leads financially, and we will be uh, extremely happy for that to be the case, yes. So I have them. extended budget periods rather than a one, a year to year, do you know, like based on a, a three to five year sort of budget to give mm -hmm. people a long term um, stability. I'm not sure how to I've got one that more at question. The moment, Sally, do you know? Um, no, we don't. Um, I mean, we try to give that stability, but because we are, as SNH, are on a one-year settlement, um, that does make it more difficult for us to make that commitment because um, we obviously can't commit funds that we no. are, are not confident that we have to commit, if you see what I mean. Um, certainly, you know, project funding is, is a different matter because that's often over three to five years yeah. uh, and it's given mm. for, for the lifetime of the project. So that's a really kind of a different, a different matter. So we should be looking at that then. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to okay. put you, yeah. get you to commit to it, but I'm sure you'll go back and tell somebody. Um, <clears throat> has any assessment been made on the potential loss of EU funding for biodiversity projects after the dreaded Brexit? Well, um, it, yes, at a very high level, but it's not specific to biodiversity. So, I mean, it's obviously clear that the loss of EU funding for all sorts of land uses um, has a potential impact on biodiversity. I think that the level that we're at is trying to assess what the scale of that is, rather than actually pinning it down to, you know, impacts on biodiversity per se, I would say. OK, thank you. Uh, I think we move on now to John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. And I would just like to uh, ask you a little bit about um, biodiversity duty reporting. And it does appear that that's um, not in the best place that it might be. I'm just wondering what action the Scottish Government and the SNH has taken since the last round of duty reporting to engage public bodies of all sizes and functions in reporting duty and specific actions towards improving biodiversity. Targets seem to be... I believe the Cabinet Secretary gave um, evidence on this issue to the PAPLS Committee um, very recently. But, Sally, can you maybe say what has been done yes. since the last round? So, since the 2015 round, um, the Scottish Government commissioned an evaluation of um, both the process for reporting and also um, the, the, the activities and the content of the report, so what, what, what public bodies were actually doing. Um, that revealed a, a, a really quite a wealth of very useful information, and as a result of that, um, some further work was undertaken, partly by the contractor, which was to produce a reporting template to make you know, make that reporting process easier for public bodies. Um, and SNH then have produced um, a series of detailed guidance um, using the template and a range of case studies. These are aimed uh, to, um, to help public bodies assess what level of reporting they need to engage in. So it's aimed at small, medium and large public bodies. It gives ad advice and guidance on the sorts of activities they might consider reporting on or or indeed undertaking, and aims very much to um, put in place a proportionate approach so that we're not expecting that, you know, a, a, a perhaps a very small public body who have no land holding and, and on the face it would have very little to do with biodiversity are not expected to produce a large report. Um, the, I think the, the, the other finding which is interesting, I think, from the, the, the 2015 reporting is that... Um, the, the evaluation showed that the work being undertaken um, and reported on by public bodies was actually meeting, um, I think with the exception of the financial target, all of the other targets um, that we're discussing here today. So that work being undertaken by public bodies in which they're reporting on is actually contributing right across the board. What bearing, may I ask, 
um, do the, the reduced um, financial um, targets have on that reporting capability at the, the E20 financial resources? So I think Ms Cunningham was, was clear uh, when she was at committee last week that, that government don't view the reporting itself to be an onerous task. Um, and it's certainly the case that there's an option for public bodies to include that reporting within their existing corporate reporting if they wish to do so. Then. So they're not required to produce a separate report if they don't, if they don't think that that is beneficial. They can include it in one of their annual reports, for example. This is the biggest issue here, not reporting, it's action and mainstreaming across the activities of public bodies. I'm going to give you a brief example of a local authority, Angus Council, that had drawn to its attention concerns about activities in an amenity woodland, the, the cutting down of trees. It, its own rangers were concerned about where this was headed. Planning officers come out and determine that because there is no planning application in place, the council has no locus, walks away, and that woodland was decimated. That's not an exaggeration, it was destroyed. It's now currently um, the, the, the subject of um, action on the part of the Forestry Commission. Now, there's an example of where a local authority that has a reporting duty here seems not across its various departments to understand its responsibilities around biodiversity. And I guarantee that's replicated across Scotland. So don't we have a very long way to go to get to the point where local authorities, as an example, but all public bodies, understand the role in this? So one of the things um, SNH is doing at the moment is to work working with um, public bodies um, to develop delivery statements. Now, these are... Um, uh, a set of detailed commitments by that organisation setting out what they plan to do in terms of protecting, maintaining and enhancing biodiversity. Um, these, these, the statements flow from the biodiversity strategy and what, they, what the process itself does is it helps to embed that type of thinking into the organisation and in the way they conduct their business and it, it results in a kind of a range of hard commitments which that organisation will, will then... Um, you know, sign up to in terms of the, the, the work they, they undertake day by day and how they take that forward for biodiversity. Um, they're quite resource intensive. We have a number of statements complete and a larger number which are underway at the moment with, public, with different public bodies. Um, as yet, local authorities, I think we have one local authority who are interested in completing a delivery statement, but we would hope as time and resource permits to roll those out much further across Scotland backed up the point I was making, we have a very, very long way to go mm. till we get to where we need to on, on issues as important as these. Uh, Claudia Beamish, then Mark Roscoe. Right, thank you, Kavina. Um, it's a follow-up to our Kavina's uh, question um, in relation to public bodies. And I'm wondering, um, having been somewhat involved in the um, development of the climate change reporting duties for the public sector, whether there's been um, discussion about the need or the value, or indeed not, of, um, of a similar mechanism uh, for biodiversity, um, bearing in mind the delivery uh, issue as well, um, between Scottish Government, SNH and uh, the appropriate bodies. Well, um, I don't think we've actually done that yet, but it seems to be a very good idea, actually, mm. to try and see what there is to derive from where we've made progress with climate change and see what um, ways in which that could be uh, sort of pursued for biodiversity. So I think the answer to the specific question is no, we haven't discussed that yet, but it's a good idea. Yeah. I think there are, are wider ways of thinking about um, where there are lessons from climate change. And I, I think one of them is um, as a kind of being on the receiving end of the climate change plan, um, the fact that there was that plan and how it was run made me, as the director responsible, make sure that we were spending money on peatland, on planting trees, on reducing waste. And so there's something in that which is about just being absolutely clear about what each player is required to do, which I think that's another lesson from, from climate change, a broader Thank one. You. Th Thank you. Mark Roscoe. I had a similar question, actually. Yeah. It was just about how you bring the two together, because it seems that particularly with councils, you know, councils are engaged in placemaking, so looking at climate and biodiversity together, particularly around ad adaptation agenda, there might be some benefit in, in reporting the two together. 
I, I think that's a very fair question that we should look at. Yeah. Yes, I think the only caution, and I think um, Ms Cunningham touched on this, this la la last week, is that the, the climate change duty is an annual reporting cycle. Um, and if, you know, if, if we are identifying resource as being an issue for reporting on a three-year cycle for biodiversity, um, we just need to weigh up the pros and cons of increasing that, that requirement. Yeah, I think John Scott, you've got further questions. No, you you're happy with that. Okay. Um, just, I think we touched on this earlier. Just an update then, where we are at in, cons in terms of considering uh, a, a biodiversity strategy post 2020. I think we are just starting to think about that. It's starting to be thought at about internationally. Um, so we've got the. This, the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties in Beijing in 2020. Um, we've asked SNH to be, begin thinking strategically about this and how we should approach it, and, they, and that's really part of what they're going to be talking about at Aviemore today with the other um, public bodies, because actually the action to meet HE is also relevant to the action to meet any more stringent targets. So it's kind of how do you... Um, increase the effort to a suitable point. Um, so I think, I mean, I think we ha we are starting. Is the is the answer to your question? Yeah, thanks. And just to wrap this up, then, Mark Roscoe. Yeah. Parliament last year uh, in the chamber on a cross-party basis voted for uh, a motion to um, support the establishment of a national ecological network in Scotland. So I wanted to ask what progress has been made on that. So, as you're probably aware, there was a stakeholder event held last September um, to consider what a national ecological network, network for Scotland might, might entail, what it might look like. Um, SNH has been asked by the Scottish Government to lead on this, and since then we've been working um, with government and with a number of the NGOs to, um, to look at um, how this might be um, played out in Scotland. Um, we are looking at an approach which is seeking to enable opportunities to improve biodiversity and improve connectivity, and which looks at the role of the existing, uh, existing network of protected areas, for example, Anatura sites um, across Scotland. At present, we're seeking to develop a, a range of principles, um, and we're testing those against a number of established projects which already deal with connectivity, such as the Coco Life project and work that's underway in the CSGN. So we would hope to have, so we, we plan to have some further, um, some further work, for, further work and testing and to come back, be coming back to Scottish Government very soon with some further proposals. I think, I think that'd be very useful, convener of okay. the committee. Will there be action in there for the national planning framework? In the way that CSGN is, is embedded. But those are there. some of the issues we're working through at the moment. Right, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your time this morning. I think that's been uh, useful to inform our thinking. We also, of course, have the uh, Public Audit Committee, I think, doing a review of local uh, government and public bodies in relation to uh, their, their biodiversity duty. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, we will move on. The fourth item on our business uh, today, our agenda today, is to consider the following negative instrument, namely Environmental Protection Microbead Scotland Regulations 2018, SSI 2018 162. Can I ask for any comments from members? Yeah. Uh, Mark Roscoe, Richard Lyle, and then Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thanks, convener. Can I just say that I, I welcome this action that's being taken uh, on a UK wide basis to tackle. Uh, Microplastics, perhaps one of the most easiest forms of microplastics to remove from the production cycle and to prevent this getting into the oceans. Um, clearly, microplastics have a, a major uh, set of problems, both physical problems, so they pass through the supply chain, through the food chain rather, but they also carry chemicals into, into that uh, food chain as well, um, which may impact on human health as well as the health of the environment. Um, I think it would be useful to get some clarity from the government about how they're approaching other forms of microplastics, in particular microfibers uh, from clothing, which perhaps represent a much more harder form of plastic to remove um, from the oceans. But nonetheless, it would, be, it would be good, I think, to hear the Scottish government's view on 
uh, how it's addressing the wider issue about microplastics and what kind of action is needed at either international level in the UK or what we can do in Scotland ourselves. Richard Lyle. Yes, sir. That was a point I was going to make also, and I support Mark Ruskell in his uh, comments. We've taken action on cotton buds, plastic straws, no microbeads, plastic waste. It would be interesting to know if any department or if the government is looking at the effect of any other consumer goods or co consumer ingredients in, in goods which uh, may affect the environment. And I think we should write to the Cabinet Secretary and ask that question. Um, Stuart Stevenson, followed by uh, Angus MacDonald. Um, just a tiny observation. I have three products for exfoliation. And I, I found, as a result of reading this, one of them has microbeads in it. I dumped it in the bin this morning. So that is real action in the Stevenson household. I very strongly support this. I do hope the container wasn't recyclable, Mr Stevenson. Uh, Angus MacDonald. OK, uh, thanks, Camille. I'm certainly pleased that these regulations are, are being introduced, especially when you consider that up to 51 trillion microplastic particles have accumulated in our oceans. Uh, and can be highly damaging when eaten or inhaled by marine life. So this is a, a welcome SSI, which will come into force imminently, uh, and hopefully similar action will be taken to tackle nurdles, which is also an issue, uh, particularly around the fourth estuary. OK, Claudia Beamish and John Scott. Thank you, convener. I'm not going to reiterate the um, arguments made by other members, of which I'm very supportive. Um, and uh, supportive of this uh, SSI. I'd just like to highlight, um, and perhaps if we, if we are agreeing with um, uh, Richard Lyle's um, request to write to Scottish Government about the wider uh, issues, that um, one of these has been drawn to my attention by the Brownies in, um, in uh, the borders, is the issue of um, uh, glitter, which um, is, is another aspect of this that hadn't come to my mind until they'd written to me. Okay. I'm just um, delighted to associate myself with this um, piece of support in the legislation as well. I think it's um, very welcome um, and identify myself with the remarks, positive remarks made by others. Indeed. So can I take it as read that we don't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument, but we will write to the government along the lines that have been raised by members? We are agreed. Thank you for that. At its next meeting on the 26th of June, the committee will hear oral evidence from Scottish Government officials on the Register of Controlling Interests in Land. The committee will also consider its work programme and its approach to work on the marine environment, financial scrutiny and the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill at Stage 1. The committee will hold a second meeting next week when it will hear from the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Michael Gove, MP, by video link. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed.